The Man Who Ate His Face I started late from my office, so I was in a real hurry that evening. My husband was in California for a business trip. Hence, I planned to spend the weekend on my own. I checked quickly to the nearby departmental store and bought snacks and a bottle of wine to relax after getting home. It was 8 o'clock already. Though my house is of 15 minutes walk from my office, I wanted to get a cab anyway. There are not many houses in these suburbs, so walking alone, even for five minutes at night, gets quite uncomfortable sometimes. I was just about to leave the store when I noticed the last cab leaving the stand. I blamed myself for taking too long to shop. There was no other way than to walk. I came out of the store and looked up to the black starry sky for a minute. Taking the shopping bag in the left hand, I began the tedious walk. The silence around me made me hear my own footsteps loud and clear. The road was straight and wide and completely empty. The streetlights were scattered throughout the way. It was a walk amidst light and shadow. After walking for five minutes, I thought to shift the bag to my opposite hand. As soon as I turned right, I spotted a shadow behind me. All this time, I noticed no one else, hence, this sudden presence of someone else startled me. I turned around and saw a weird guy walking slowly behind me. There was no doubt that this guy was a homeless man. He was wearing a knit cap that made it impossible to see his face. His shirt and trousers were torn off in many places. A very stinky smell was coming from him, which signified he hadn't bathed in a long time. His head was shaking to the ground, and from his body language, I could tell he was heavily drunk. I didn't bother and kept walking. Five minutes went away, but that guy was still walking behind me. He didn't pick up his pace or try to surpass me. He just kept walking behind me, taking slow and small steps. I started walking a bit faster and decided to take a shorter route besides the nearby kids' park. Somehow, I reached the end of the road and turned right to head for the park. For a second, I turned back to check out that guy. He was still walking in the same manner, except for this time, I noticed his wide hands and the color of my face turned pale. There were drops of blood on his hands. It seemed like someone scorched the skin out of his hand, making the blood gush out of his flesh. A sound of chuckling came from his mouth. I still couldn't see his face. Terrified and shocked, I ran towards home. This time, the man picked up his pace and started to run behind me, making that obscene, spine-chilling laughter. The more I ran, I heard his chuckles turning into mad cries. His behavior implied that my fear was entertaining him immensely. I was panting and perspiring even on that chilly winter night. As I managed to cross the park, I noticed the porch light of my house within a distance of 10 to 15 feet. I bashed myself on the front door of my house. I took out the key under the doormat quickly. My hands were trembling, yet I managed to open the door and slammed it hard after entering the house. I locked it immediately and locked all the windows in the back door as well. My heart was racing like a wildfire. It took me five to ten minutes to breathe normally again. After a while, when I realized there was no sign of that guy or his horrifying laughter, I peeked through the curtains of my living room. The streetlights made the area clearly visible. I looked everywhere. A sense of fear was still inside me. There was no one outside as far as my eyes went. I felt relief. I went to the kitchen and had a glass of water. Things got back to being normal again, but soon I realized it was only for a half an hour. What happened next changed my entire experience with life. I sat down to watch a movie, pouring myself a glass of wine. The movie was going well. Just then, I heard a low thud. The sound was like a knock on a glass window. I followed the thudding sound to find out where it was coming from. I checked all the windows of my house, but couldn't find anything. As I started to walk upstairs, I heard a squawking sound coming from the attic. I guessed it could be the attic mouse. I grabbed a torch and went up the attic ladder to check. The attic was dark and dingy. It was filled with a bunch of old furniture and cardboard boxes. We used the attic just like a storeroom. I moved around the flashlight, but nothing unusual caught my eye. The sound also stopped the moment I turned on the flashlight. 
I thought it was my tired head imagining everything. I headed for the ladder to get down and go to bed. As I took the first step, that squawking sound began again. My ears followed the direction of the sound. I had no doubt this time that it was coming from my little attic glass shed. I flashed the light onto the sound. I was a bit drunk, so it took me a second to figure out. But when I did, my heart flunked to my throat. It was him, the homeless man. He was leaning over the attic glass window. As he knocked the glass with his long, dirty nails, the squawking sound came out again. His face was full of scars. I could see clotted blood all over his face. He started to scratch the skin with his filthy nails. I was standing there, numb. I didn't know how to react. He was looking directly at me. His inhuman stare made me feel like he almost licked my soul with his bloody tongue. He started to laugh like a maniac, then started to tear his own skin with his long, sharp nails. He continued his malevolent laughter by spitting blood all over the attic window. I wanted to run away from my own house, but I knew the way I will be safe is to stay inside the house. The man didn't just stop there. He started to eat his skin after scrubbing it off. I could almost hear him chewing on his own flesh. I felt like I am going to faint. There was nothing more vicious I have ever experienced in my life than watching him doing these insane things to his own self. Suddenly, I heard the phone ringing downstairs. I ran immediately and picked it up. It was my husband. I told him there's a maniac on our roof. He immediately called 911 for me. My mother, who lives three houses away, rushed to my house after hearing everything from him over a followed phone call. I was sobbing and walking around the house after being scared like hell. My eyes went onto every window, thinking maybe now that devil will break in. I waited, sitting in the corner of my living room for my mother, shivering, sweating, heavily breathing and gasping. After five minutes of waiting, which felt like a long five hours, my mom arrived. Just when my mom's car pulled into our driveway, I heard a loud thud as if someone jumped from a high place to the ground. Then I heard sounds of running footsteps. My mother stayed with me until my husband came back. I couldn't sleep that night at all. My mom said I had several nightmares and murmured in my sleep. The police came and searched the entire locality, but they found no one. Two days later, local news flashed that Atlanta police have arrested a meth addict, rapist, who recently broke from prison. The guy had murdered three young girls after abducting them from an empty road. Due to heavy drug problems, he has been put under strict watch to keep him away from availing any kind of drug. He was so violent and highly addicted that he scratched his own arms and legs for not getting drugs. The TV channel also flashed his face. The image they showed was of a mutilated faced man. He was wearing the same knit cap and shirt and trousers. I couldn't make out his face, but his spine chilling smile remained the same. I still can't figure out how he climbed up the roof. It's even more terrifying to think that he might have spied and waited for a while to figure out I was alone in my house. The impact of the incident left me in terrible shock. I couldn't walk alone at night for almost a month. I am still afraid to be alone in my own house. My husband has put up a high security alarm in our house. Even then, when he goes abroad for office work, I go to stay with my mother or sometimes she comes to stay with me. Wherever that man is, I pray to God that we never ever meet again. Every year before Christmas, a terrifying feeling grabs my heart and mind. It's been 10 years, but I still can't erase the haunting memory of one Christmas day. My son was five years old when this incident happened. After the separation from my husband, Damien was my everything. He was always nice to people and good with kids at school. Whenever I went to pick him up from school, I always saw him surrounded by friends. I was happy to see him fitting in nicely with groups. The week before Christmas, Damien's school stage a children's play. After the show ended, I was driving home with him. I was praising him for his excellent performance in the play when he just told me, I made a new friend today, Mom. I smiled back and said, You've been such a good boy this year, and I'm sure Santa will bring you lots of gifts for Christmas. His face lit up when I told him that. 
we got back home and had dinner. I tucked Damien into bed and he went to sleep. The next morning, when I woke up and went to the kitchen to make breakfast, I noticed the cookie jar was broken. Shattered glass and cookies were lying all over the kitchen floor. I got really pissed off and called Damien into the room. Damien was brushing his teeth and came to the kitchen about 10 minutes later. He looked up at me and said, What is it, Mom? I said in an angry voice, Did you break the cookie jar last night? He shook his head and said, No, it wasn't me. I said, Really? Then who was it? Damien looked at me and said, it was Mr. Nobody. As I was in no mood for such jokes, I got even more angry and said, Don't you try to fool me, Damien. Damien started to sob and said, I am telling the truth, Mom. I told you I made a friend yesterday. He said his name was Mr. Nobody. He was the one who broke the cookie jar last night. Then he started to cry. I picked him up into a big hug and decided to drop the issue. I figured, like every other child, he too had an imaginary friend, and due to the fear of being grounded, he was just making up a story. Christmas was now two days away. My ex-husband called and said that he'd like to join us for Christmas dinner. I knew how much Damien missed his father, so, for his sake, I decided to put aside our marital issues for one night. That evening, I was doing house chores when I heard Damien's footsteps in my room. Damien, how many times have I told you not to play in my room? I screamed out loudly. I could see a shadow moving on the wall opposite my bedroom door. I rushed to the corridor to scold Damien. I was about to peek inside when I heard Damien's voice from behind me. Mom, I'm hungry. I was shocked and absolutely terrified at the same time. I slowly walked towards him and said, Did you go into my room? But Damien said, No, I was in my room and did something really creepy. He looked over my shoulder as if someone was standing behind me. I immediately turned around, but didn't see anyone there. Later on, I checked my room and the entire house, but all the doors and windows were already locked. Also, there was no sign of any forced entry. I got really worried this time and noticed weird things happening around the house. I started decorating the house as Christmas was knocking on the door but sometimes I noticed things being misplaced from their positions. Like, if I kept a lamp beside the porch in the living room and left for a few minutes, I always ended up finding it in the corner of the wall. Damien was too small to lift such a heavy lamp, and there was no one else in the house. One night, I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water and thought to check on Damien on my way back. As I got close to his door, I heard his voice talking. He was speaking to someone. He talked in a very low voice, but I could still hear him. Damien was saying, You can't walk around the house at night like this. If mom sees you, she won't let you stay with us. I immediately entered his room, thinking someone broke into our house. But there was no one inside. Damien was sitting on his bed nervously. I asked him, Who were you talking to? He looked towards his closet and then looked back at me. I said in a tensed voice, Damien? You are scaring me now. Is there anyone in your room? He still didn't say anything and just kept staring at me. I went to the closet and opened the door with my trembling hand. There was no one inside. I heaved a sigh of relief and scolded Damien for staying awake so late. I tucked him into bed and went to bed myself. I couldn't sleep that night. Damien's weird behavior had me worried. The next day was the day before Christmas, so I decided to take Damien to the mall to let him buy things for decorating the Christmas tree. We had a fun time and I bought him some ice cream. On our way back, I asked Damien, How's your friend, Damien? He said, Which friend, Mom? I said in a hesitated manner, Your new friend, Mr. Nobody. Damien's face turned sad and he said, I don't think we're friends anymore, Mom. I asked, Why is that? He replied, he doesn't listen to me. Also, I feel scared of him. I was really quite shocked to hear him talk about his imaginary friend as if it were real. After getting back home, I told Damien, What does Mr. Nobody look like, Damien? He went to his room and brought me a drawing he had made. When I looked at the first page, I saw a very creepy figure. 
Damien drew himself on the bed, and there was a thin, triangle-faced man standing beside him. The man had a huge smile on his face, like someone had cut his mouth from one ear to the other. His eyes were huge, and his eyeballs were blood red. The picture disturbed me to the core. I turned to Damien and said, How did you meet this guy? He said Mr. Nobody came to watch him play and asked to come to our house with him. I felt goosebumps on my skin. I said in a low voice, Do you mean he lives in our house now? Damien once again looked behind me and I was about to turn around when the doorbell rang. The doorbell scared the shit out of me, but I somehow managed not to let my fear show. As I opened the door, I saw Paul standing in the doorway. Paul is my ex-husband. We exchanged smiles and I let him in the house. Damien was so excited to see him just before Christmas and they both started to decorate the Christmas tree. I couldn't shake the terrible feeling about Damien's imaginary friend, Mr. Nobody. After dinner, as Damien was put to sleep, I told Paul about all of this. He laughed and told me that I shouldn't be taking a kid's imagination so seriously. And that's the main thing I hated about Paul. He never took me serious unless we got into trouble. The same thing happened in this case as well. On Christmas morning, we were all feeling excited. I went to Damien's room and woke him and Paul up as Paul was sleeping in his room. We all came to the living room and witnessed a shocking scene. The Christmas tree was in complete ruins. It seemed like someone scratched it with something sharp and pointy. The toys and ornaments we hung on the tree were all scattered all over the floor. Paul and I both knew it wasn't Damien. But Damien started to cry and said, Trust me, Mom. It's Mr. Nobody. He broke the Christmas tree. I didn't know what was going on. Neither did Paul. We calmed down our son and started to rearrange the decorations once again. Around 6 o'clock that evening, we had everything back the way it was before. I cooked a delicious dinner and Damien got excited opening his Christmas presents, which were filled with toys and candies, and Damien started smiling again. Damien was watching the Christmas Day Parade on the television while Paul and I sat at the kitchen table, quietly with our glasses of wine. Paul understood I was still disturbed with everything going on in the house. He spoke in a low voice. You should probably leave this house and move somewhere else. I can arrange that for you and Damien. I was already thinking about that. I nodded to Paul's suggestion and agreed to take his help on this matter. We were all set on leaving the house the next morning and staying with my parents for a while until we could get a new house. I tucked Damien into his bed and went to sleep. Paul wanted to have a few more drinks and watch some television, so I left him on his own. Around 2 a.m. in the morning, I heard a soft crying voice coming from Damien's room. Damien's room is on the opposite side of the living room. I rushed to his room and noticed Paul passed out on the couch. I thought my son might have had a bad dream, so I didn't wake Paul. As I stepped near his room and opened the door, I froze in fear. I will never be able to forget what I saw in that room but I can say with great assurance that I wasn't imagining it. I saw a thin, triangle-faced man lying on the ceiling over Damien's bed and looking directly at him with his blood-red angry eyes. Damien was sitting on his bed and sobbing in fear. He was so horrified that he could barely cry out loud. I screamed at the top of my lungs at that demonic figure who looked at me and howled in his spine-chilling voice by opening his huge, dark mouth. His howl sounded like it didn't belong in this world. My scream woke up my husband and he ran to Damien's room. By then, I had already grabbed my son and came out of the room. I said in a crying voice, Get us out of here! I don't want to be in the house for another second! We all got out of the house immediately and stayed the night at a nearby motel. The next morning, we went back to my house and packed a few necessary things before leaving for my parents' house. I left Damien inside the car because I didn't want him to step inside this house ever again. As we got into the car, after getting everything from the house, Paul started the engine. Damien was sitting behind me. He looked back at the house and said, Look, Mom, Mr. Nobody is waving goodbye to us. He's got a smile back on his face. I don't know who this Mr. Nobody was, but my mother said it might have been a demonic spirit who followed my son home. We took Damien to a psychiatrist. Due to my parents' pressure, I also took Damien to see a priest. 
he conducted a few rituals, saying it was to bless my son's aura and soul. Now, I don't know how much it helped, but Damien hasn't seen Mr. Nobody after that horrifying Christmas night. Matthew was all set to go out party hard tonight. He called his best friend Rita and said, Hey, excited for New Year's Eve? What are we all doing tonight? With that same excitement in her voice, Rita replied, Of course, I have told everyone to arrive at 10pm sharp at the club. I will text you the address as well. Don't be late, dumbass. She chuckled and disconnected the phone. Within two minutes, a text popped up in Matthew's phone. I am our club, 2021 Subscribe Street, 10 p.m. Matthew looked at the clock. It was 8.30 already. He finished his coffee and ran to the washroom to get ready. Matthew lives in his apartment alone. His parents stay in Texas. Three years earlier, he shifted to New York and started his career here. Don't know why, but Matthew loves New York. He feels so normal while walking down these streets. This city is always busy, and now due to New Year, it has turned even more glamorous. The roads are decorated with bright lights, stars, Happy New Year banners. People are looking at their best, and every nightclub, pub, restaurant is filled with their crackles of joy and laughter. IMR Club is nearly 15 minutes drive from his house. Matthew has been to this club many times. Rita and Matthew often go there to grab a drink after a long, tiring week at work. The streets are covered with white snow, and blinking decorations appeared like a dream to Matthew. He stood near the wide dining hall while combing his hair. His phone rang suddenly, and he snapped out of his thoughts. It was his mother. He answered the call. Hi, Mom. What's up? His mother spoke from the other side. Happy New Year in advance, honey. Don't get too drunk. Matthew laughed and replied, Come on, Mom. Also, it's still the 31st of December. He talked to her for a while and noticed it was 9.30. Matthew ended the call with his mom and hopped inside his car. While driving to the club, crowds of people could be seen cheering on the streets. Matthew parked his car near the club and saw his friends standing in front of the club and waiting for him. He went to them and everyone got super excited. Matthew was about to enter the club with them just when his eyes went to the dark corner at his left. A man was sitting in the corner, hiding his face into his knees. He figured out that there is a small, dingy alley lying in that corner. Suddenly, he lifted up his face and looked at the sky. His face looked heavily scarred. He then looked at Matthew and smiled with his crooked tooth and heavily scarred face. There was something in his smile that made Matthew's heart crawl into his throat. Rita came to him and said, What happened? Let's go. Matthew shrugged off, saying nothing, and went inside the club to party on New Year's Eve. With the sound of joy and laughter, a group of young people celebrated New Year's Eve at IMR Club, and at 12 p.m., they all wished each other a very happy New Year. Around 1 o'clock, we all got up to leave. Matthew wished Rita good night and came out of the club looking for his car. The streets were still breaming with people celebrating the new year. He took out the keys and approached the car. Matthew noticed that he has forgotten to lock the car earlier, but he was too drunk to stand there and regret his mistake. He got inside and started the car. Rita yelled at him while standing at the entrance of the club. Matt, you sure you can drive? Matthew said with a smile, Yeah, don't worry. I will reach home in 15-20 minutes max. He then waved his friends goodbye and drove away. The streets were filled with people and he was driving slow just to be safe from his side. After five minutes, he took a left turn and his eyes went on the back view mirror. As he looked onto it, Matthew's blood turned cold. He saw someone was sitting in the back seat. He couldn't see the man's face, but he could see his creepy, wide eyes watching Matthew from the dark. For a second, Matthew was numb and terrified. But then he thought, I am already hell drunk. There's no way I can fight this guy and drive the car at the same time. So he decided to be rational about the situation. Matthew asked in a scared voice, uh, hello, um, do you need to go somewhere? <laughs> the man laughed in a very bizarre way and said, I thought you wouldn't even notice me. Matthew was sure that this man's only intention is to rob him. So, without wasting any more seconds, he said, Look man, if you want, you can take my wallet and leave. I won't even fight you. Just please leave my car. 
I don't want any problem tonight. The man screamed at the top of his lungs and said, I am not some fucking beggar. Is that how you treat people in New Year? Keep driving or I will slice your throat with my sharp knife. The man then came forward and Matthew recognized his face in a flash. It was that same homeless guy near the club. He could see his face clearly now. His eyes were bursting out. There was something unusual about his pupils. They weren't like the pupils of humans. Instead, looked more like cats or a completely different creature. The guy told in the same spine-chilling voice, keep driving the car. There will be a right turn ahead. Take that turn. Do as I say, or this will be the last new year of your life. Matthew had no other option but to listen to this man. He had no idea if the man really had a knife with him or not, but there was no way he's taking the risk. After seven minutes of driving, the right turn came. As Matthew took the right turn, they got onto an empty road. There was hardly any car on that road. It was like an adjacent lane to the highway. The roads looked very spooky surrounded by bushy trees on the sides. There was hardly any light except headlights of Matthew's car on the road. After driving like this for five minutes more, something unexpected happened. The man on the back seat started to cough terribly. Matthew noticed his eyes were turning even more wide as his tongue came out of his mouth. The man had a really big tongue which creeped the hell out of Matthew. He realized there was something very wrong with this guy. Suddenly, the man told in a choking voice, Stop. Stop the car now. Out of fear, Matthew immediately stopped the car. The man got out of his car while coughing terribly. It felt like he couldn't breathe. Matthew sat inside the car, being numb. He didn't know what to do. He thought to drive back and get the hell away from this man as soon as possible, but something didn't let him. He sat in the car, staring at this man's unusual behavior. The man crawled on the road and came right in front of Matthew's car. The headlights were falling on him. What happened next terrified Matthew for his entire life. As the man choked to death, suddenly his bones started to crack on his own. He sat down on the highway while screaming like a creature from another world. The sound of his bones creaking fucked up Matthew's mind completely. He was already in a state of trance due to the alcohol. Now the sound of choking mixed with the bones cracking felt like a living nightmare. Matthew kept staring at this guy and slowly realized that the horror is yet to come. After a few seconds like this, the man suddenly got up and started to tear his own skin from his body. The way he was tearing off his skin made it seem like he was wearing a costume. He threw patches of skin, soaked in blood, here and there while screaming in pain. Matthew couldn't believe what he was witnessing. He knew he wasn't that drunk to imagine all this shit. After taking the entire skin off, the man turned at the car and looked at Matthew. A horrifying human figure was standing in the middle of the road. There was not a single piece of skin on his body. The veins and red flesh gushing out of this vicious creature. Matthew was breathing heavily. He felt like his heart will stop right now. The man again stared at the sky and said in the scariest voice ever heard by human ears, It's time to get a new skin. You just turned lucky, as this time I'm going to pick a woman. Happy New Year, Matt. <laughs> the creature laughed in a demonic voice and hopped into the jungle like a four-legged animal and disappeared into the darkness of the woods. Matthew rushed his car way back home. He didn't talk, didn't come out for an entire week. He left New York after a month and came back to his hometown. One night, he was reading an article on Greek mythology, which made a truly terrifying revelation. Greek people believe in a demon who is said to be a shapeshifter, or sometimes a skinwalker. These demons are said to acquire any creature's skin or shape to hide in the human world. Matthew knows these are just some old scary folklores, but how can he ever tell anyone that this New Year's Eve, he actually came across a skinwalker? He prays to God that he never <laughs> sees that creature again in his entire life. Around 6.30 in the evening, Samara reached her destination. As she stepped her foot outside the car, the view surrounding her amazed her mind. Tall, dark mountains were all around her. At the foothill of these mountains, the gigantic old mansion stood like a dark fairy tale. 
The setting reminded her of the tales of Count Dracula. The exquisite artistry of Romanian architecture attracts Samira like nothing else. She started to take out her bags from the car just when the huge iron gate of the mansion opened and a man came walking to her. Hello, you must be Miss Willis. I am Daniel. It is me with whom you talked over the phone. Samara guessed the manager of such a mansion will be an old person, but Daniel was a young, handsome man. She took her bags and said, Call me Samara, and started walking towards the mansion. Daniel smiled and accompanied her inside the mansion. The mansion was ten times grander from the inside. The large hallways and corridors were filled with vast oil paintings and expansive decorations. A counter stood next to the door which finally gave the impression that this is a hotel. An old guy was standing on the counter. Daniel went to him and said, Give the keys to Miss Willis's room. The man handed over a metal key with room number 104. She then followed Daniel upstairs and another man came who carried her bags. Daniel told Samara that the mansion has many rooms divided into four tiers. They have finished renovating only the ground floor and the first floor. The second and third floor are right now out of use, but Samara can take a look for her research, but she might find a few rooms locked for maintenance purposes. Room 34 was at the end of the corridor. Daniel unlocked the room with the key, and the hotel staff put Samara's bags near the bed and left. The room is unique on its own. There was a soft white bed, a couch near the glass window that gave a view of the hills. Samara turned to Daniel and said, I'm already loving this place. Daniel smiled back and told her, the dinner will be ready around 8.30 p.m. The hotel staff will come to notify her when it's ready. Samara locked her door and lied on the bed. She was mesmerized by the view around her. The mansion was glamorous and mysterious at the same time. Around 8.15, the hotel staff came and told Samara that dinner is ready. While Samara walked down the stairs, she noticed three people were sitting at the dinner table. One is Daniel, and the other two people are the man at the counter and the hotel staff. Daniel smiled and said, We don't have many guests right now. Actually, we were planning to open this from the next month after the complete renovation. But due to your research work, we are amazed to have you here. Samara smiled and sat at the table. They all started eating. The food was tasty, but Samara felt a bit weird. She noticed apart from Daniel, the two other men hardly speak. After the dinner, Samara wished Daniel good night and went to her room. The hotel staff didn't speak a word all this time, but when Samara was about to close the door of her room, the man came to her door and said in a low voice, Have a good night's sleep, madam. Please, stay in your room at night. Otherwise, you might get lost in the dark. A sense of unknown fear grabbed Samara's hand. She felt that something is actually weird here. Due to the tiresome journey of the whole day, Samara couldn't think anymore. Also, she has to get up early to study the mansion for her research work. Deep sleep came down to her as she laid on the soft bed. Late night, Samara woke up from her slumber. She felt very thirsty, but as she went to drink from the jar near the bed, she noticed it was empty. She looked at her phone. It was 2 a.m. at night. Samara opened the door and came out. The corridor was dark. Only the moonlight showed her the way. Samara came down the stairs. She took a jug from the dining table and without any more delay, walked to her room. Just when she was entering the room, her senses all woke up. A sweet melodious sound captured the mansion. It took a few seconds to realize that the sound was coming from a harp. Someone was playing harp in this huge mansion? That too, at this hour of night. Samara was shocked, but the sound felt so attractive as if it were calling her to follow it. Samara started to walk upstairs following the sound. As she reached the second floor, she realized the sound is coming from the end of the corridor. The second floor was completely empty. The harp kept playing. Samara was almost at the end of the hallway and she noticed the sound was coming from the last room. 
The room number was 303. Daniel said there was no one else in this hotel. Then who is living in this room? Just when the question came to Samara's mind, her curiosity increased. She knocked on the door and said, Who's there? The sound stopped immediately. Suddenly, the atmosphere around her got too quiet. Samara twisted the doorknob, but found it was locked from the inside. The silence around her started to frighten her. Without wasting any more time, she quickly got into her room and locked the door. She didn't hear any sound the entire night. The next morning, a cleaning lady came to her room. Samara was all set to get to her work. While taking her notebook and writing supplies, she asked the small, middle-aged woman, Do you know who stays in 303? But the reaction she got was totally unexpected. The cleaning lady got terrified of her question. Her face turned pale, and drops of sweat appeared on her forehead. She said, I, I don't know, madam. Then she began to clean her room. The sudden change in her behavior after hearing about room 303 made Samara even more curious about that room. But she didn't say anything and left for her work. The mansion was filled with instances of Romanian artwork. Samara was standing in the garden and inspecting the garden fountain just when she heard a familiar voice. How's your work going so far, Miss Willis? Daniel came to her with a big smile. Samara said that she's loving it already. She then asked Daniel in a hesitated voice. Um, don't mind me asking, but is there anyone living in room 303? Daniel replied with a surprised face. Room 303? No, but why would you go there? We already told you it's out of use for maintenance purposes. Samara felt embarrassed for wandering around in this private property at night. She answered in a humble voice. Actually, last night I went to the dining hall to get water. Just then I heard someone playing a harp. I followed the sound and discovered it was coming from room 303 on the second floor. I just got curious because you told me there was no one else living here. Daniel hesitated too and said, Um, yes, I told you the truth. No one lives in room 303. Old mansions like this sometimes resonate with many types of sound. I am sure it was something like that, what you heard last night. So, enjoy your stay, Miss Willis. Daniel's words made Samara realize that he didn't at all like the incident of last night. But Samara couldn't understand why everyone is acting so mysterious about this room. So she has to know what exactly happened there. Samara decided to check this room again tonight. Her gut feeling told her that these people here are definitely hiding something from her. At dinner, Daniel didn't say a word to her. The other two people ate quietly as well. As Samara finished her meal and started to walk upstairs, she saw Daniel say to the hotel staff, Take a jug of water to Miss Willis's room. Hope she will have no reason to wander around the empty hall tonight. And then gave her an angry look and left. Samara became even more stubborn now. After the hotel staff left the jug in her room, she locked the door and switched off the light and started to wait silently. Tonight is the night. Samara will find out what's the matter with this room 303. Around 2.30 a.m., she came out of her holding, a candle in hand. The mansion was completely silent. Only the whooshing sound of the rusty wind outside was echoing in the hallways. She tiptoed to the second floor and reached near room 303. As she twisted the doorknob, the door opened with a creaking sound. How strange. The door was unlocked tonight. Samara entered the room. The room was freezing cold. There was a large window in the room which had no glass on it. A cold wind was coming from the window by blowing its dirty curtain away. The moonlight from the window and the candlelight on Samara's hand made the room look very spooky. She noticed this room is just like her room, but it had only one difference. An old wooden harp stood in the middle of the room. The harp seemed unused for a very long time as the thick dust all over it had the actual color of the instrument. 
Samara went to the window and looked outside. The dark mountains were standing in front of her eyes. There was nothing much she could find, so she thought to go back into her room. Just then, a heavy wind came and blew out her candle. Suddenly, she heard a chuckling sound. <laughs> she quickly turned towards the door and saw a tall, thin woman standing near the harp and strumming the chords with her creepy long fingers. The moonlight fell on her face. Her eyes were wide as if she could see inside Samara. She was wearing a worn out sleeping gown. Her hairs were floating in the air as the wind ran through them. Samara asked in a tensed voice. Sorry, the door was open so I just came to check. I heard you playing the harp last night. That's why. Before she could finish, <laughs> the woman laughed in a very scary way and said, They might have told you no one lives here, right? They told the same thing to the man who came here just like you in the middle of the night. But he came anyway, and then couldn't leave. Fear grabbed Samara's neck. She couldn't understand what this woman was talking about. She said in a frightened voice, I better get back to my room. Sorry to disturb you. As she stepped ahead towards the door, the horror unfolded in front of her eyes. With a terrifying sound of bones cracking, the woman's head turned upside down and she started laughing like a maniac. Samara's heart started to beat like a wild horse. She screamed, but no voice came out. She felt like the chilling laughter was reverberating all over the valley. Her eyes lost vision as she collapsed on the ground. The next morning, Daniel came to room 303 looking for Samara as she was not in her room. As he opened the door, he saw Samara's white, bloodless face. She was lying on the floor, her eyes full of fear and trauma. She was dead. The hotel staff, the cleaning lady, and the man at the counter came too. Four of them stood there silently, and the cleaning lady started to weep in a low voice. Daniel looked to the hotel staff and said, Bury her at the back of the garden just like the previous traveler. We are running a business here. If people can't hold back their curiosity, no one can save them from dying. Throw her stuff down the mountain and get back to work. We will be having guests from the next month all around this mansion, and make sure you keep this room locked all the time. The Midnight Musician still haunts room 303 of this old mansion in Romania. Let us know if you dare to take the risk by visiting this place. We will give you the address. My Solo Hiking Trip It all happened during a hiking trip three years back. I have always been athletic from a very young age. My parents enlisted me into a rock climbing crash course when I was just 12 years old. I have taken years and years of training, and above all that, I always loved spending time in nature. I went on a hiking trip near Utah's White Mountains. The ambiance felt amazing as I walked amidst dense forests staring at the mountains surrounding the area. Forest has a different sound than any other landscape. I could hear owls hooting, the wind howling, and many unknown forest creatures hiding behind tall, wide trees and dark bushes. The sun was shining bright, but the forest was covered with big bushy trees, hence the sunlight could hardly touch the forest ground. Being a nature lover, I had a habit of bird watching as well. I always carry my binoculars whenever I go hiking. The nature around me felt so amazing that I lost track of time. While I was busy watching a big, colorful bird fly away from one tree to the other, I realized the sun was about to set soon. I felt a bit hungry. I sat under a nearby tree and took out the sandwiches I packed for myself. There was plenty of time to get down the hill, so I thought to eat first so that I can get some energy. After eating, I got up and glanced at my wristwatch. It showed 5.30 p.m. In cities, 5.30 p.m. is not that late, but in forests, an afternoon can appear as night. I took out my torchlight and flashed ahead just when huge lightning struck in the distance. I looked up at the sky and noticed dark clouds have summoned themselves and were ready to pour at any moment. I didn't expect rain, so I didn't bring my umbrella with me. I got a little worried now and started to walk fast. 
I calculated inside my head that, after half an hour of straight walk ahead, I will reach the downhill road. As I walked, I kept hearing the dark clouds roaring above my head, the wind blowing rapidly among the forest. After 15 minutes, big drops of rain started to fall above the trees and a huge thunderstorm took place. It was thrilling, but scary at the same time. I was in a deep dark forest, that too in the middle of a thunderstorm. The wind got so gusty that I could barely walk. The heavy raindrops almost pierced my skin after falling from the sky. I had no idea what to do, and just when I started to run, my feet get stuck in a pit. I fell on the wet forest floor. It was raining so heavily that I overlooked the pit on the ground. My flashlight broke with a loud sound and the atmosphere around me turned dark and scary. I somehow managed myself and got up, but after walking for 10 more minutes amidst this terrific storm, I realized that I have lost my way. I looked at my watch and it showed 8 p.m. By this time, I should be going down the hill whereas I was still stuck in this dense forest. There was no way I could call someone for help. The storm was growing with each minute. Suddenly, an idea came to my mind. I climbed up the tallest tree nearby and took out my binoculars. As far as my eyes went, I could only see the forest. Just when I was thinking about how horrible it would be to spend the night in these trees with an ongoing storm around me, I noticed a yellow light on the left side of the forest. I zoomed a bit and saw a wooden house standing there. I immediately came down from the tree and started to run towards the house. I was adamant because this was my only chance to survive the night. Panting and breathing heavily, I reached the house and knocked on the door. Anyone here? Please open the door. I could hear the low voices of people coming from the house. I knocked again and almost cried. Hey, please help. I got lost in the woods. Please open the door. With a loud creaking sound, the door finally opened. A man peeked behind the door and smiled at me. He told me in a very comforting voice, Good Lord, what happened to you? Please, come inside. I quickly got inside without any more delay. It was an old wooden house. The living room had an old rusty porch, two wooden chairs, and a wooden table. At the center wall, there was a small fireplace. The man gave me a cloth to clean myself and said, Please, sit near the fireplace. You will warm up soon. I will go get my wife. I pulled the chair near the fireplace and sat on it. After a while, a woman entered the room with that man. I have never seen such a sad face. That woman seemed tired and upset at the same time. I thought she might be disturbed by my sudden interruption. The man guessed my feeling and said, My wife has been through a chronic disease for a long time. Please, make yourself at home. The woman creepily smiled at me and said, Yes, please don't mind. I often get lost in my thoughts. Actually, my son is very naughty. He is always giving me tantrums. I smiled and thought, how surprising that this family is living in the woods all by themselves. I didn't see a car near the house. I was wondering how they are managing daily livelihood in the middle of nowhere. Just then, the man said, it's common to get lost in such a deep forest when you don't know it well. We are living here for quite a while now. Our son Jimmy knows the forest even better than the owls and night creatures. I told them I came for hiking and got lost due to this sudden thunderstorm. The storm was still going outside as I could hear the glass window clinking along with the whooshing sound of the wind. The rain almost stopped, but thunder and lightning kept striking the forest as usual. The woman offered me to dine with them, but... I was already enough ashamed to break into their house, so I just asked them to give me a room to sleep for the night. I told them I will leave early morning so they have nothing to worry about. The man and woman smiled again. The woman said weirdly, Well, there's a lot of night left to pass. But don't hesitate, you are our guest for the night. She then looked at her husband and said, Darling, please take him to our guest bedroom. I will go and put Jimmy to sleep. The man took me to a room following a narrow passage beside the living room. He opened the door for me and said, Have a good night's sleep then, and please lock your door. Our son might disturb you at night. He is a very naughty kid. He barely sleeps. The man left. 
I had no energy left in me, so I locked the door and threw myself into the bed. The room was dark, and the moonlight coming from the window helped me to spot the bed. I didn't want to turn on the lights, because it was, anyway, matter of one night. I was just feeling lucky to find a shelter, finally. I don't know how long I slept, but suddenly, I woke up hearing giggling around the room. I tried to listen closely and heard it again. It was a kid's muffled chuckling. I remember the man told me to lock the door and I forgot. I got up on the bed and my eyes took a few seconds to adjust to the darkness of the room. The pale moonlight was coming from the window. I saw a five or six year old boy standing near the window, facing his back at me. I said in a sleepy voice, Hey, you should go and sleep. Your parents will be angry if they saw you awake. I was going to get up myself to take the boy to his room, but I couldn't do it as what happened next made my heart drop to my stomach. The boy looked at me. His eyes were white and huge. There were no eyeballs inside them. I said in a shaking, terrified voice, Who are you? The boy laughed like before and ran outside the room. I immediately got up and lit the light switch of the room to find my backpack. The room was very unclean. There was dust all around the room and cobwebs were hanging in the corners and the ceiling. The bed I slept on was covered with mud and an old worn sheet. I realized no one has used this room for a very long time. I looked for my backpack all over. Just when I remembered, I slid it under the bed before dozing off. As I knelt down to get it, I discovered the ultimate horror. Three corpses were lying under the bed. A man, a woman, and a skeleton of a child in between them. The man and woman were recognizable as their corpse still had dried out flesh and skin on them. My head went crazy because I have seen them before. They let me in this house and offered me to spend the night in the room. I didn't waste a single second and came gasping out of the room. As I reached the living room, I glanced back at the narrow passage and what I saw terrorized me for my entire life. The man and the woman were standing at the end of the passage with their son. All of them had white big eyes with no eyeballs inside them. Their black hollow mouths were open to their chest. As I ran for the door, they all started to laugh in a distorted voice. <laughs> I don't remember how I managed to get myself out of the house or that forest, but the next morning when I woke up, I found myself in the hospital bed. I had a bandage over my head, my arms were filled with scratches, and my body was covered in immense pain. A police officer came to me and said that some village people found me unconscious in the forest, covered in mud and blood. They informed the police officers, and I eventually ended up in this hospital. The cop asked me about all the details, and without thinking, I told him all I could remember. I told him how I took shelter to a house of a dead family and every other thing that I could remember. The cop took a pause and said, I can't tell you what you saw was real or your imagination, but there is a house in the forest, but no one goes there as local people believe it is to be haunted. The house is completely abandoned and highly unusable for any living human being. I don't think anyone has lived there for the last 10 years. I asked him, but what happened there? The police officer said in a sad voice, a small family lived there. A man built that house to live in peace with his wife and only son named Jimmy. The boy fell ill with the bite of an unknown forest insect. He used to play in the forest even though his parents told him not to. They couldn't save their only son and out of pain and guilt, the man and the woman hung themselves. Some people say they did it to live with their little Jimmy's spirit. And since then, their ghosts haunt that house every night. The cop also told me that there's a saying that if you go to the house in the daylight, you won't see anyone. But at night, the house turns into a regular cozy home like everyone else's. They even heard laughter coming out of the house at night, like a happy family is having dinner together. <laughs> Adam woke up hearing loud screams. It was coming from his neighbor's house. They were having a New Year party. Adam looks at the clock. It was 12 p.m. He heard them wishing Happy New Year to each other. 
Adam's life has changed a lot within the last year. He got up from his bed and looked at his bedroom wall. The wall had an enlarged picture of a married couple. It was Adam and Selena. Adam met Selena while studying college. They got married and were living a happy life when Selena suddenly changed into a different person. She was seen depressed all the time. Last year, on this day, Selena jumped from his office roof. Adam still doesn't know why Selena committed suicide. He doesn't even have the minimum idea of what she was doing at his office that night. Staring from his bedroom window, Adam saw the entire sky filled with colorful crackers. Everyone in the city is busy celebrating the new year, except Adam. He got back to his bed and tried to sleep. He has lots of work tomorrow. Just when he closes his eyes, his phone rang. It was a call from Sophia. Sophia was Adam's secretary, but she left the job last year. Adam answered the phone, saying, Yes, tell me. Sophia replied in a soft voice, Happy New Year, Adam. Adam said in an irritated voice, Thanks, same to you, and disconnected the call. The next morning, Adam reached the office and entered his cabin. There were only a handful of people working today. Most of the employees are on the holiday. Even though Adam could have taken a break, he didn't. Julia came with a cup of coffee and said, Happy New Year, sir. Here's your coffee. Adam looked at her and said, I am going to leave for a business meeting. I will be back in the office by 3 p.m. I will finish the rest of the files then and leave for home by 7 p.m. So just arrange the pending files for me and then take the day off. Julia nodded and went to put the cup on his desk. Suddenly, something very weird happened. As Julia was about to place the cup on the table, she felt like someone pushed her from behind and the cup fell on the desk, spilling coffee all over Adam's white shirt. Adam stood up in anger, saying, What the hell are you doing, Julia? Julia said in tearful eyes, I am so sorry, sir. I don't know what happened. I just couldn't control my hand. Felt like someone pushed it. Adam looked at her with an irritated face and yelled, Ah, oh, shut up. Just arrange the files and leave. Julia left the cabin with a sad face. She had no idea what happened all of a sudden. Adam got up and took a close look at his shirt. The coffee stain was quite big. He can't go to a business meeting like this. He called the officials and told them due to some emergency, he has to shift the meeting after lunch. Now, Adam will have to work late at night. He got on into his car and headed for home to change his cloth. His house was a half an hour drive from his office. He unlocked the door and got into his bedroom to change. He was tucking his clean shirt when his eyes went to the enlarged photo on the wall. He was beyond surprise. The photo that featured Adam and Selena on their wedding day was not there anymore. It seemed like someone scratched Adam's face, tearing the photo in many places. The glass of the photo frame was shattered too. Broken pieces of glass were lying all over the floor. Adam immediately called security. As the security picked up the phone, Adam shouted, Did anyone get inside my apartment? The security said that no one entered the apartment since the morning. Also, if anyone broke in, the door shouldn't have been locked. Adam was feeling confused and annoyed at the same time. He said to himself, What the hell is wrong with my life today? He cleaned all the broken glass and stormed out of the house in anger. It was already 3.30pm and he couldn't even eat. He met the clients in a conference room in a five-star hotel. After all the troubles, the meeting finally started, and fortunately, it went well. After the meeting, Adam went to the hotel restaurant to eat. He looked at the sky from the large glass window of the hotel restaurant. The sun was setting on the horizon. The reflection of the restaurant could be seen on this huge glass window. Adam took the first bite of his sandwich and looked up again to the window. What he saw made his heart drop to his stomach. There was a reflection of him sitting in the restaurant, but who is that? Who is the person standing behind him? There was a reflection of a horrible looking woman. Her face was partially bandaged and her body was covered in blood stains. Adam turned around immediately, but there was no one. He was sitting all by himself. 
Adam felt like he knew this woman, but couldn't see her clearly enough in the reflection. He said to himself, what is going on with my head today? Somehow, he finished eating and went to pay the bills. He looked at the cashier and said in a low voice, Um, excuse me, was there a woman here a few minutes earlier? The cashier looked at him with surprised eyes and said, No sir, you were the only one eating here at this time. After lunch hour, the restaurant mostly stays empty. Adam smiled awkwardly and left for his office. When he reached the office, there was no one inside. The empty office premise stood in front of him like a barren field. He went to his cabin and sat on his chair. He said to himself, what a life. A huge pile of files was lying on his desk with a small note that read, I have arranged the files just like you said, sir. Sorry for the morning incident. Adam felt bad for howling at Julia earlier. She didn't do it on purpose. As Adam started to think about it, something came to his mind. Julia said that someone pushed her hand, but there wasn't anyone in the cabin except them. This year has begun with a very unnatural start. Adam started to work on the files. His cabin was on the left side. He can see the workplace outside the glass door of his cabin. All the computers were shut down. The tube lights on the ceiling brightened the empty office in a very spooky way. After working for an hour, Adam decided to pour himself a cup of coffee. He was about to get up when he saw a shadowy figure standing at the corner of the workstation. The corner was dark and far from his cabin, so he couldn't get a clear view. He came out and said in a loud voice, Hello? Anyone here? No sound came except the sounds of winds blowing. Adam checked the area but couldn't see anyone. He walked to the coffee machine and inserted a coin for a black coffee. An uneasy feeling was going inside his mind, as if someone is watching him. Adam raised his hand to take the coffee cup, just when he felt someone chuckled in his ear. Out of shock, he spilled some of the coffee on the floor. Drops of sweat appeared on his forehead. Adam turned around, but couldn't see anyone this time as well. He said in a shaken voice, Who is there? Come on out. He started to feel scared now. He threw the coffee into the dustbin nearby and said, That's enough for today. I am going home. To hell with this office and to hell with this work. He rushed inside the cabin and picked up his coat to leave. As he opened the cabin door, he heard a woman's voice. Adam. Adam. Can't you hear me, hun? That voice said. Adam's face turned pale. He recognized this voice, but how could it be? It was the voice of his dead wife, Selena. He replied with hesitation, Is this some kind of fucking joke? Who is this? The woman said again, I am waiting for you, hun. Come here. Adam couldn't help but follow the voice. He walked to the office roof, following the sound. The roof was empty and dark. Small lights were placed at the edge of the roof. The chilling wind was piercing Adam's heart. He was feeling extremely cold. Suddenly, he heard the same <laughs> chuckling sound behind him. As he turned around, this time, his heart dropped into his stomach out of fear. He said in a panicked voice, Selena, oh my god, but you are... Dead, right? Selena replied. Her face was partially covered with a bandage. Blood was dripping from her blonde hair. Her clothes were ripped and soaked in blood. Adam's eyes were wide in fear and shock. He fell on the floor. Selena started to walk towards him, slowly. And Adam started to crawl back, like prey in front of a hungry lion. Selena said in a spine-chilling voice, Happy New Year, hun. I have come to get you. Adam screamed in fear, saying, Why? What have I done? Selena replied, I saw you with Sophia. How could you do that to me? You don't deserve to live. Adam's face shook in shame. He indeed cheated on his wife with the secretary, but he never knew her ghost would come back to take revenge on him. He gasped and started breathing heavily. Please, forgive me. I fired her, believe me. Selena stopped for a second and said in a low voice, Do you want to see what happened to my face when I jumped off this roof? Slowly, she took off the bandage from her face. Adam has never seen such a horrifying face in his entire life. 
Her left eye was hanging down from the eye socket. The skin was smashed and red flesh was coming out of it. Her teeth could be seen widely as half of her lips were cut out. She screamed, scaring the hell out of him and started to run towards him. Out of fear and huge shock, Adam lost all his senses and ran towards the end of the roof without seeing the edge of it. With a loud thud and blood freezing scream, Adam's body fell down from the sixth floor of his own office. Blood splattered all over the ground as his brains came out of his skull. The next morning, the local news flashed. An unfortunate death has taken place. Famous industrialist Adam Smith committed suicide last night from his office roof. A year back, his wife Selena Smith also committed suicide in the same manner. The police are investigating this matter. Everyone is shocked and out of words after discovering his body on the night of New Year. I was coming home from my best friend Emma's house. Emma and I are childhood friends. Even though she forced me to stay back, I decided to head home. She lived in the house above the hill. It was just 7.30 p.m. and I thought, I will take the bus from the nearby bus stop. I reached the bus stop and saw a guy already sitting there. The guy looked a bit odd to me. He had a hard face with long, messy hair, which made him look like a homeless person. He wore a gray sweatshirt with black jeans that were torn out at many places. Being a five foot three girl, I already knew I don't appear as intimidating to strangers. But anyway, I maintained a distance from him and stood there with a serious face. Emma called me in between, asking if I have gotten the bus or not. I talked to her for a while, just to feel less uncomfortable with this guy's presence. I could see in my peripheral vision that this guy was looking at me after every five to 10 seconds. Then he took out his phone and got busy in texting. After ending up the call with Emma, I looked at my phone. It was 7.45 p.m. Also, there was only 10% battery left on my phone. I felt like an idiot for not charging it at Emma's house. I stared at the long empty highway, but there was no sign of the bus. I was already disturbed for being alone with this strange guy. Just then, he stood up from his seat and came towards me. I didn't pay any attention and started to scroll down my phone just to avoid him. The guy came close to me and said in a husky voice, Hey, do you have a lighter? Without looking at his face, I replied in an irritated voice, I don't smoke. The tone of my voice was clear enough to make the guy understand that I am really not liking him near me. The guy didn't say anything, just standing there facing towards me. I got really annoyed at this time and looked at him. Dude, I told you. I don't have a lighter. Now fuck off. His eyes were lifeless still. He gave me a very creepy smile and started to walk back without turning around. As he steps back, facing at me, he said, You girls like to pretend that you hate attention, but that is exactly what all you bitches live for. I got really pissed off at him and shouted at the top of my voice, Listen, you jerk. If you don't leave this place right now, I will call the cops. My friend's house is nearby and her father has a gun, too. Also, she already knows I am standing here to head home. All I have to do is scream loudly once and you will be in great danger. He wasn't expecting such a reaction from me, so his face turned a bit pale. While we were having this episode, I noticed a private car coming towards us. The car came near the bus stop and stood directly in front of us. There was an old woman driving the car. She looked at me and said, Do you want me to drop you, dear? I live down the hill. I thanked God for sending this lady to my rescue, and without wasting a single second, I got into her car. Needless to say, this guy walked away from the bus stop with an expressionless face. But when the car drove away, I saw him smirking at me from the rearview mirror. I couldn't believe his audacity, but somehow I calmed myself down. 
I quickly turned towards the lady and thanked her from the bottom of my heart. The lady looked at me and gave me a big smile. She then asked me what I was doing there with that guy. I told her I didn't know that guy and that he was bothering me in a very offensive manner. The lady then said, Women these days need to be more careful. You never know when you step into a trap. I thanked her again for saving me from a really bad situation. All she did was kept smiling. We were driving on the highway and there were very few cars, but still, she was driving slowly. I thought maybe she was being cautious about driving alone at night. Also, the way she pulled brakes signified she is not used to driving much. But after a terrible time with a creepy stranger, I could hardly complain, so I just kept quiet and waited to get over with this night by reaching home. The lady told me that she is going to visit her nephew who lives down the hill. She will stop by the house for a second to inform them and will drop me home safely. I was very happy with her kind behavior. I joined in small talks with her just to pass the time. After 20 minutes of the ride, she stopped at a gas station to get gas. The gas station was empty, so I knew it won't take long. She got out of the car with her purse and told me to wait inside and went to pay for the gas. I decided to call my parents just to inform them why it's taking so long, but just then I realized my phone's battery had died. The lady forgot her phone on the dashboard, so I thought to make a call using it. I thought she wouldn't mind if I called my parents and I will also explain to her once she comes back. I took her phone and swiped the screen. The phone wasn't password protected, so I got lucky. I don't know how to explain horror, but I literally felt what horror can be right then and there. As I swiped the screen, the phone wallpaper flashed in front of my eyes. The wallpaper of the phone was a photo of the lady with a tall, bearded, long hair guy. Yes, it was that same creepy guy from that bus stop. My stomach dropped. I was completely out of my mind. I didn't expect to face something like this, but I realized that the guy on the bus stop and this lady are somehow connected. She is trying to lure me to a dreadful, life-threatening trap. I immediately got out of the car taking her phone with me and started to run. I didn't stop. I didn't look back. I just ran. I ran for my life. I was sobbing in fear and scared like hell. I dialed my dad's number while running like a maniac. Fortunately, he was getting home from work. I couldn't explain everything perfectly, but somehow managed to explain that I am in grave danger and I need his help. He told me that he's coming to pick me up and told me to stay on the highway. But I didn't stop still. I was extremely scared, thinking that that woman might follow me, so I kept running straight ahead. My dad picked me up from the highway. As soon as I got home, I hugged my mom and started to cry like a baby. I told them everything about the guy at the bus stop and this lady. My dad praised my presence of mind for taking her phone with me. I handed her phone to my dad, and he reported this entire incident to 911 right that moment. The next morning, the cops came to our house and asked me a bunch of questions. I explained the entire matter in great detail, because I wanted them to catch this sinister duo before they end up framing any other innocent person. After two days of search and with the help of her phone, the cops collected a lot of information and finally managed to arrest these two evil people. They discovered that the lady was the mother of this creepy guy. They were professional kidnappers who often trapped young women from highways. What made them more devilish than other criminals are their sinister way of luring victims into their trap. The guy used to spot young, lonely girls on highways and make them fearful of his offensive behavior, just like he did to me. He would also let the mother know if the plan was going well through text messages. And then, the mother will take this opportunity by offering a ride to these already freaked out girls. Any girl will say yes to her just to get rid of this guy. This way, 
she would kidnap that girl during the ride with some excuse, and both of them used to ask for ransom by making threatening calls to the victim's relatives. They are going on with this scam for at least one year, but due to their cunningness and the unique criminal mind, no cop could ever catch them. Also, no one could testify how they looked as they murdered their victim after receiving the money or not receiving it either. So far, they have killed three young girls in three different cities of California, and I was supposed to be their fourth victim if things didn't take a different turn for me. I still wonder what could have happened if she didn't stop at the gas station and I didn't think of calling my parents from her phone. It's been three months now. I have bought a car for myself with my own savings. I drive my own car everywhere I go, and if it gets really late, I choose to stay at my friend's place to avoid being alone on the highway at night. I will never forget what that lady told me that night, that women these days need to be more careful. You never know when you step into a trap. It was a chilly winter night. The snowfall was going outside. I threw woods in the fireplace, just when my grandpa said, Tonight is bringing back memories of my young days. I was about your age then, Alex. I looked at him and smiled. My fiance Rose was sitting right beside grandpa. We came to spend the winter holidays at my grandparents' house. Grandma said in a soft voice, Which memory are you talking about? Grandpa replied, that incident regarding the winter night watch. Rose said in a curious voice, What is this winter night watch? Before Grandpa could reply to her question, Grandma said in a serious tone, Come on, Steve, don't scare these children with your horror story. They have come here for the holidays. Hearing this, I got interested as well. I sat down on the porch beside my grandpa and said, What horrible story? Grandpa said in a calm voice, well, it is indeed a scary story, but it is 100% true, but I won't blame you for not believing me. Rose looked at me and said in excitement, please tell us, I love your horror stories. Also, this is a perfect night for scary tales. Grandpa took a sip from his glass of wine and said, this is not a story, I can tell you, but you sure won't get scared, right? I said in a confident tone, yes, yes. We are not kids, Grandpa. Tell us. My grandpa started, I was living with my mom back then. I lost my father at a very young age. After finishing high school, I opened up a shop of my own and decided to take care of my mother. The locality where I grew up was a small town. Those days, cases of theft and robbery often took place during winter nights, so our local sheriff built a small group of its own to patrol the area. The group was divided into two sections, to work as night watch alternatively. This was a way for young boys like us to earn some extra cash, and also provide some community service. Also, it was fun to roam around the snowy streets with their childhood pals, drinking whiskey from the flask. We caught four thieves, and stopped four robberies from happening due to this night watch practice. The town people appreciate this gesture of community service, as everyone felt safe because of us. We were a group of three people, including me. It was me, Rob, and Simon. We all grew up in that town and were close friends. Every Tuesday and Thursday nights, we used to patrol the area with flashlights. Simon carried a rifle for safety purposes, but he never used it except one time. Rob was drunk most of the time. I used to carry an iron rod casually. One night, we were patrolling near the kids' playground when we heard someone scream. Rob pointed out to a house situated on the opposite side of the playground. We noticed a small cloud of smoke was coming out of that house. At first, we guessed that the house was on fire, but as we walked close to the house, we realized it wasn't the house that was on fire. As Grandpa paused to take another sip of his wine, Rose asked in a tense voice, Then what was it, Grandpa? Grandpa got back to his story and said, It was the person who lived inside it. Hearing this, I got a bit startled and said, What? What do you mean by that? Grandpa went on saying, The house belonged to a woman named Julia. After her husband's death, she was living alone in that house. She was a depressed and lonely woman. 
That night, Julia set herself on fire to commit suicide. As we got close to her house, we saw a horrible scene. Julia was on her bedroom balcony. She was burning like hellfire. Her screams pierced our ears. We could see her melting flesh dropping from her body. She wanted to end her life, but I hope she didn't realize that she chose a very painful way. The smell of burning human flesh made Rob vomit on the ground. Before we could get inside and save her, she fell down from the bedroom balcony while burning in fire. What a horrible sight it was. The local sheriff arrived with the paramedics. Most people of the town came to her house, but by the time they all came, she was already dead. It was a terrible night for the three of us to witness her that way. There was no one to arrange for her funeral, so the hospital staff took care of her corpse. Her house remained empty and soon became abandoned. No one was ready to buy her house after hearing how she died on that balcony. I said in a casual voice, This is indeed a horrible incident to witness, but what is scary about this? My grandpa smiled and replied, The scary part began after her death. After three to four days of this incident, another night watch group reported to the local sheriff. They said that last Monday night, while they were patrolling the area, they heard a sudden scream of a woman. They thought someone is in trouble. After following that sound, they reached Julia's house. The house was dark and looking haunted. The group stood there for a few minutes, but nothing happened. When turned around get back, their eyes got stuck at the end of the road. They saw Julia was standing there with the vicious look burnt face and body. She watched them with her spine chilling grin and then suddenly started to run towards the group screaming. The group lost their mind and ran away to save their lives. After this incident, the entire town was afraid to go out after dark. Many people started to see Julia's haunting spirit. No one dared to go near her house or even in daylight. One winter morning, a man was coming from his late night shift. It was around 4 a.m. The street was filled with fog. He was walking with a flashlight in his hand. Suddenly, he felt a shadow was moving in the fog. He said in a fearful voice, who is it? As usual, no reply came. He started to walk fast to get home early. He was about to take the left turn leading to his home, just when Julia came out from the fog and stood in his way. The man got terrified seeing her vicious face laughing at him. He fainted on the ground after screaming. Local people heard his voice and came to his rescue. They carried him into his house. Incidents like this became regular and the town was terrified after the sunset. On Tuesday, our turn came for the night watch. We three were quite brave as we were the first one to witness Julia's death. My mother told me not to go out that night, but I didn't listen to her. Around 11 p.m., Rob and Simon came to my house. We took strong brandy and flask and began patrolling. The first few hours went like every other normal night. We were walking in the empty streets when Rob said, Look, someone is trying to break into Julia's house. Simon and I saw a thin guy going inside the house with the porch window. I said in a low but sarcastic voice, Don't think this guy is from our town. Otherwise, he wouldn't have dared to go inside the house at this hour of the night. Despite the ghost rumors and supernatural occurring, it was our duty to stop any kind of robbery or theft inside the town. So we walked to her house to catch this intruder. Without making much sound, we entered inside the house. The house was dark and dusty inside. Cobwebs were hanging from the ceiling. The stairway to Julia's bedroom was lying in front of our eyes. We were just about to take the first step when we heard a spine-chilling scream of a woman's voice. What we saw next scared us for our entire life. We saw a burnt female figure coming down the stairs. She was grabbing a man's neck with her fleshless, burnt hand. The man was choking and gasping for air. Simon fired at the female figure to stop her from killing the man, but the bullet went through her as if she was made of thin air. The woman was coming towards us. Out of fear and shock, we ran out of the house. We heard the man scream and saw him stomping over the hurt ground. The sound of the skull cracking after hitting the hard ground echoed in our eyes. We looked back and saw Julia's ghost disappearing in the fog as the man died lying on the street, choking in his own blood. 
The next morning, the sheriff came and identified the man as an escaped convict. It came to know this guy broke into this house to hide, but he chose the wrong house. The townspeople were adamant and terrified of this. Someone came up with the idea of arranging a proper funeral for Julia and burning her house to the ground. Rose and I were highly disturbed hearing this entire incident. I asked in a shaken voice, what happened after that? Grandpa said in a low voice, we arranged a funeral and burnt her house. After that, none of us ever saw her in the town again. Every winter that night comes to my mind. Whenever I smell something burning, at the back of my brain, it reminds me of Julia's face. Mike woke up early this morning. He went to the bathroom to freshen up and then looked into the mirror. He took a good look at himself and noticed the bruising on his left cheek. Last night, his father had slapped him hard across the face for calling him an alcoholic, which he actually is. Mike looked at himself in the mirror for a bit and said to himself, <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mike. When he was eight years old, his mother had died of cancer. Since then, he basically raised himself. His life had been a journey full of hardships and rebukes. But every year, when Christmas came around, a smile appeared on his face. Every Christmas, his beloved Uncle Jack would come to visit him at their house. Right now, Mike is 16 years old. He just has to wait two more years so that he can move out of his house. His father never treated him right. Sometimes, Mike feels it's the alcohol that changed his father into this completely different person. Mike went downstairs and started to prepare breakfast. He peeked into the living room and saw the same sad scenario once again. His father passed out on the living room couch after another long night of heavy drinking. He put a few pieces of bread into the toaster and went to take his father to his bedroom. Mike has become accustomed to becoming the caretaker of the house and his father. After finishing his breakfast, Mike calls his Uncle Jack, and hearing his uncle's voice over the phone made Mike's eyes sparkle with joy. He said, Hey, Uncle Jack, when you coming over? Uncle Jack replied, I'll be there soon. Hold your horses, kiddo. They both laughed with great enthusiasm. Mike's face lit up in joy. He then decided to start planning out the decorations for Christmas. There was snow all over the backyard. Mike went outside and he saw the green, huge assortment of Christmas trees scattered in the woods. Their house was at the top of the hill, surrounded by mountains. He remembered how his mother made him a snowman when he was little. Mike misses her every single day. After spotting a good-sized Christmas tree, Mike started to cut it down so he could take it home and decorate it. He works at the mall down the hill, and that's how he manages his food and other expenses. Mike's father works at a garage, but he spends all his money on alcohol. Around 7 o'clock that night, the living room was all prepared for a nice small Christmas celebration. Mike had put the Christmas tree right in the center of the room. Beautiful, colorful, shiny balls were hanging all over it. A golden bell was tied with a red bow, which was placed at the very top of the Christmas tree. Mike decorated the room with colorful chains. He hung two pairs of socks on the slab of the fireplace. It was getting pretty cold, so Mike put some wood inside the fireplace and started a fire. Just then, he heard his father's coarse voice and looked behind him. His father was standing in the living room with that same angry look on his face. Mike told him in a low voice, Merry Christmas, Dad. But his father turned away and said, I'm going into town to celebrate on my own. Otherwise, you and your boring uncle will ruin my Christmas Eve. As his father grabbed his jacket and opened the front door to leave, Mike noticed his Uncle Jack was arriving. Uncle Jack went to hug Mike's father, but he replied in a rude voice, I'll keep your filthy hands off me. I'm running late. And with that, he got in his car and drove away. Mike and his Uncle Jack stood in the doorway quietly and watched his father drive away. 
Seeing Mike's sad face, Uncle Jack hugged him and they went inside. Uncle Jack had brought some delicious food for their special Christmas dinner and handed Mike a gift. As Mike opened the present, his face began to light up. It was an iPad. He'd always wanted one but could never afford it. He smiled and said, Thank you, Uncle Jack. This is the best gift ever. The small house at the top of the hill blossomed in happiness and joy for one night. But who would guess that that joy would be temporary? Mike and Uncle Jack started to talk about sports and music while enjoying some roasted turkey and mashed potatoes. Uncle Jack poured himself a glass of wine and said, Now look, I just need you to be strong for two more years, Mike. Then you can come to New York and stay with me. I'll arrange for your college and everything. If your mother was still alive, you wouldn't have to face so much trouble. Alcohol has made your father a completely different person. Mike shook his head and kept eating quietly. He knew that his Uncle Jack was the only person in the world that truly cared for him. They finished their dinner and decided to watch a movie. Everything was going great when suddenly the doorbell rang. Uncle Jack went to answer the door while Mike was doing the dishes. Mike yelled from the kitchen, Who is it, Uncle Jack? The uncle replied, I don't know, kiddo. Looks like someone left you a Christmas gift on the doorstep. Mike was surprised. He looked at the clock. It was already 10 p.m. Who would leave a Christmas gift at this hour? Mike washed his hands and wiped them on his jeans. He then walked to the living room and saw a beautifully wrapped box on the dinner table. Uncle Jack gestured with his eyes and said in an excited voice, Go on, open it! The box was wrapped with silver glittering paper and tied with a red satin strip. With curious eyes, Mike unboxed the gift. There were three more boxes inside. He took out the three boxes and realized there was something in each of them. Uncle Jack was sitting on the armchair near the fireplace, but out of interest, he too came near the table. The three boxes were all different sizes. One was small, there was a middle-sized one, and the third was the biggest. Mike decided to open the little box first. What happened next changed Mike's life forever. Inside the box was an object kept inside of a zipped up plastic bag. As Mike took the object out of the bag, Uncle Jack's wine glass fell to the ground and shattered. The object was a human ear. The ear appeared to be preserved for a long time as it had no blood on it. Mike couldn't believe his own eyes and was frozen in fear. As his eyes went to the other two boxes, he then noticed there was a small note inside this box. With a shaking hand, he picked up the paper and read it. It said, David Brown. Mike knew that name. David Brown was a boy from Mike's middle school. David used to bully Mike a lot. He once punched Mike so hard in the face that Mike suffered serious injuries to his nose. Shivers went down Mike's spine. Uncle Jack screamed in horror saying, What the hell, Mike? Who's David Brown? Why did someone send you his ear as a Christmas gift? Mike didn't answer his uncle and went to open the next box. He was breathing heavily. Drops of sweat appeared on his face. As he unwrapped this one, the horror grew even more. This one had a severed index finger in it. It was the finger of a woman. Even though it was preserved like the ear, it still had red fingernail polish on it. Just like the smaller box, this box too had a note inside. On the paper was another person's name, a name that Mike remembered very well, Stacy Roberts. Stacy Roberts was the owner of the house that Mike's family rented when they lived down the hill. Mike's mom loved that house, but after she passed away, they had difficulties paying rent as most of their money went to paying for the medical bills. One morning after Mike's mother had passed away, Stacy came to their house and told them to leave the house immediately. Mike and his father begged her to give them another week to arrange for a place to stay. 
but she didn't give them an ounce of kindness. As Mike went to get their things, she did an extremely cruel thing. Mike's mother had a pearl necklace, which he kept in order to remember her by. But Stacy came up to him and snatched the pearl necklace from him, saying, This will pay for your past due rent, you piece of shit! As she shoved a crying Mike out of the house. The memories flashed in front of his eyes, and he couldn't help but break into tears. Uncle Jack took Mike and made him sit on the couch. He then said, What's going on here, Mike? Please, tell me, who's doing this? Mike looked up at him and in a scared, muffled voice said, I don't know, Uncle. I have no idea. Uncle Jack turned and looked at the last box on the table, then looked back at Mike with terror in his eyes. He went over and opened the box himself. As soon as he unwrapped the box, he let out a gasp of air and took a few steps backwards in shock. Mike slowly walked towards the third box and peeked inside. There was a severed foot lying inside a zipper bag in the same manner as the rest. There was no sign of blood and the skin was completely pale. The note inside read, Matthew Scott. He recognized the name as somebody he worked with. He was the son of the store manager. A few days ago, he had come to work and started to harass a female customer. As Mike went to stop him, he pushed Mike to the floor and kicked him in the stomach. Mike still had the bruises on his stomach, which he didn't tell anybody about. Both Mike and Uncle Jack sat quietly on the couch. They were both shaken with horror. None of them expected their Christmas Eve to take such a bizarre turn. Uncle Jack said in a terrorized voice, We should call the cops right now. Mike nodded his head while crying. Uncle Jack went to the table again to put all of the horrifying things inside the main box when he found a letter in it. He quickly turned towards Mike and screamed, Oh my god, what the hell is wrong with Christmas this year? Mike rushed over to him and snatched the letter from his hand to read it. The letter said, Your fourth gift will arrive soon. Mike couldn't even think anymore. He lost his calm and started crying out to Uncle Jack. <laughs> Call the cops! Quick! Uncle Jack grabbed the phone and started to dial 911 with his trembling hands. And just then, the doorbell rang. Their faces froze in fear. They stared at each other blankly as a feeling of dread climbed up Mike's neck as he knew there was something even more horrible waiting outside for him. Uncle Jack froze in place like a statue and kept looking at the door. Mike walked over to the door. He could feel his heart racing like a wild horse. He opened the door and noticed another box on his doorstep. He took a step outside of his house. It was snowy and freezing cold. The wind was howling in the forest, and the night sky stood still, as though it was witnessing the fear in Mike's heart. Mike quickly bent down and picked up the box in his hands, but noticed that there was something different with this box. The bottom of the box was stained red and dripping blood. He took the box inside and quickly opened it up. What he found inside almost gave him a heart attack. Inside the box was a freshly chopped hand. Blood was dripping out of it. The bones and flesh were gushing from the cuts. But this time, there was no note to be found. Because there was no need for a note. Mike recognized the hand. The hand had his father's wedding ring on it. And not only that, someone had carved the words, Merry Christmas, into the hand. Everything turned pitch black in front of Mike's eyes as he collapsed to the floor. When he opened his eyes, he found himself lying on a hospital bed. Uncle Jack was sitting next to him with a sad look on his face. Mike looked at him and said, Where's my dad, Uncle Jack? To which Uncle Jack said that the cops had found his father in a dingy alley, lying unconscious in a pool of blood. He was returning home from a pub last night when someone knocked him out and chopped off his hand. He had already been admitted into the hospital's emergency ward. Mike stared at the ceiling 
and thought to himself that he'd never be able to celebrate Christmas for the rest of his life. And worse, he will never know who took such gruesome revenge on all these people who treated Mike in such a bad way. Those were my graduation years. I rented a place with one of my batchmates. The place was 10 minutes away from our college campus. I was a student of journalism, so most of our classes used to revolve around field experience. We had to cover a lot of places for reporting, taking interviews, etc. Thus, after a pretty busy and tiresome week, the weekends were our only relaxation. Saturday night, I used to dine out with my friends. We often stayed out late on weekends. The area we stayed was safe, and we never faced any trouble, no matter how late we arrived home. My mom often called saying girls shouldn't stay out so late at night, but I and my roommate knew the area so well that we had nothing to be worried about. It was winter. The trees on the street shed all the leaves, making the area look quite spooky at night. Due to the cold, there were very few people on the road after dark. The week was tiresome, as we had a bunch of projects. Hence. The following week, I was dying to go out and chill for some time with my friends. I and my roommate decided to go out Saturday night as both of us were too tired to cook at home. There was a place two to three blocks from our campus that served real good Chinese. We went there. There were only a handful of people in the restaurant. I was surprised to see this place less crowded. My roommate read my thoughts and said, Everyone went to see their relatives this weekend, I suppose. Also, the cold is too much for people to go out these days. I agreed with her because even after wearing a thick leather jacket with gloves and cap, I was still shaking. We sat down at the table near the fireplace. The waiter knew us very well, so he came to us with a smile on his face and said, Having fun this weekend, girls? I smiled back and nodded my head, saying yes. We then ordered our food and the waiter poured us two glasses of wine to warm ourselves up. Since childhood, I have been quite an observer. Wherever I go, even if I don't pay much attention, I always end up observing every little detail around me. Because of this habit, I have encountered weird things about people or places many times. But never did it bother me for life, until this moment. We were chatting to pass the time until the food arrives. Needless to say, we were really hungry. My roommate was complaining, saying, it takes longer for the food to arrive just when my eyes went to the corner of the restaurant. I saw a weird woman sitting at the left corner table. She was looking at the fork stand lifelessly. Her hair was all messy. Clothes were damped and dusted. Her boots were filled with mud and seemed really old as they lost the shine. She looked really creepy with her wrinkled face and wide pale eyes. She had long fingers with dirt-filled nails. I hardly judge people, but her wrinkled clothes with dark spots on them definitely indicated her poor lifestyle. She just kept staring at the forks and then took one out of the stand. She didn't look at me once all this time, as I couldn't help but notice her. Suddenly, she picked a paper napkin from the table and started tearing it with a dinner fork for no reason. The way she was destroying them appeared a bit violent to me. After five minutes, our food came. As I already said, I was feeling really hungry so I decided to ignore her and concentrated on my food. My roommate and I kept eating, and eventually, I stopped noticing her. Ten minutes passed when I noticed the same waiter bringing food to that woman's table. My eyes again went to her. I saw her food plate. She ordered chicken wings tossed in some spicy sauce. I don't know if you all think of me as a judgmental person, but trust me, guys, I have never seen anyone eating in such an unusual manner. Her eating method almost creeped me to the core. I saw her grabbing two to three chicken wings at a time and shoving them into her mouth. She was eating like she hasn't eaten for a very long time. The spicy sauce was all over her fingers. The red sauce got smeared all over her lips and chin. This made her mouth look even creepier than before. Her eyes were on her food all this time, but suddenly she looked up and our eyes met. I felt someone poured buckets of ice into my stomach and my entire body froze within a second. Her huge pale eyes were directly fixed at me. She didn't move, didn't utter a single word, just kept staring lifelessly. Her face covered with red sauce seemed like a bloody nightmare. 
My roommate sat facing her back towards the woman, which is why she couldn't see any of this happening. I was feeling really uncomfortable, so I chose not to tell my roommate about her or any of it which was happening in front of my eyes. This uncomfortable situation resided for another 10 to 15 minutes. The woman finished the rest of the chicken wings, but her eyes were fixed at me. I can't explain how horrifying she looked. She kept eating her food, staring at me as if she was eating my soul. After she finished her meal, she wiped her dirty hands on her clothes even though there were paper napkins present at her table. She then stood up and took out the money from her worn out handbag and left it on the table. I felt a bit relieved that she's finally gonna leave and I'll never have to see her again, but only if I knew. She started to walk towards the exit. I pretended to look at my phone as if all this time I wasn't even aware of her existence. Just when she was about to pass me, she stopped right behind my back. My heart paused. Drops of sweat started to run down my spine. I could sense her presence right behind me. My roommate was busy eating while talking to her boyfriend, so she didn't notice her at all. I realized the woman was standing behind me and watching my phone. I didn't have the guts to turn around. My fingers were all numb. I was just praying to God. Please make her walk away. Make her walk away. She stood behind me for 10 to 15 seconds, then giggled in a very disturbing <laughs> voice and walked away. As soon as she left the restaurant, I calmed myself down. I managed to finish my food and told my roommate, we must head back to our room right now. She was surprised for a bit, seeing me panting like that, but somehow I convinced her. We reached home as fast as we could. At some point, my roommate even asked me, why am I walking so fast, but I didn't stop for a second. Once I reached home, my roommate asked me if I was doing okay because I am behaving really weird. I dodged her questions and told her, I'm just tired. I better go to bed. I entered my room and locked the door and out of fear went to lock the windows as well. I don't know why I went to look out for my bedroom window. As I peered from my bedroom window, I saw her. She was there. She was standing in front of our house, looking right at my window. I was more than shocked and insanely terrified. I couldn't believe that she actually followed us to our house. I was out of words. She just stood there with the same lifeless stare and kept giggling. Suddenly, a sense of being alive shook me off and I ran to my roommate's bedroom. I started banging her door as loud as I could. I cried, calling out her name. She opened the door and I told her, there's some creepy woman standing in front of our house. She got out of the house, even though I told her not to. My roommate was brave enough, so she made a round around the property just to be sure there weren't any mugshot or burglars stalking our house. But no trace was found of any living person all around the house. My roommate told me that the wine might have hit me a bit hard and I have been spooked by a tree or shadow cast by a tree or something else. I knew what I saw, but I didn't argue anymore. I chose not to tell her about the incidents in the restaurant because I didn't want to freak out my roommate at that point. So we just locked all the doors and windows and went to sleep. The next morning, I told her everything and she got scared too. We came home early after our classes for a week. Also, we didn't leave our house at night for four to five days. There was an unknown fear in our hearts for a long time. I am just glad that I never saw her again. We decided not to tell anyone about that creepy encounter, but often at night, I still wake up having nightmares of a giggling sound. Whoever you were, you weird, creepy woman, let's not meet ever again. Hi, my name's Shelly, and this incident happened on a Christmas night long ago. I was still in high school back then, and I was having lunch with my friends, Kate, Matt, and Jim, at our school's cafeteria. It was just us four, and we often hung out together. Being close to Christmas, everyone was talking about plans for that day. My friend Matt said, Well, hey, we can all have a sleepover at my house. 
My parents will be gone for the holiday. We can party and drink as much as we want. Huh, high school life is probably the best time ever for teenagers, so we all got excited upon hearing his plan. I told my mother that I would be spending Christmas night at Kate's place. Kate lived with her grandma, so it was easy for her to sneak out at night for a Christmas party. After school, we all went to the mall to shop for the party. The mall was filled with Christmas decorations. Jingle bells were hanging all over the mall. And there was even a guy dressed as Santa, giving out candies and gifts to all the kids. Kate and I bought some snacks and decorations and left for Matt's house. Matt's house was a pretty good distance from the mall. On our way, Jim called me and said, Hey, have you guys gotten here yet? I said, No, but we're on our way. When are you going to get over there? Jim said in an excited voice, Oh, I'll be there real soon. I'll see you at the party. As we drove down the road, we noticed people having fun with their friends and family. The roads were covered with pure white snow, and it was really cold, so I rolled my car window up. After about 10 to 15 minutes, we left the township area and got onto an old dusty road. I told Kate, thank God for GPS, otherwise we'd have gotten lost by now. When we arrived at Matt's house, we saw Jim and Matt standing at the front door. The snow-covered house was decorated with neon lights and was looking kind of spooky. We went inside and sat near the fireplace to warm ourselves up. Matt offered us some wine from his dad's collection. We had a few drinks and started to put up the decorations that we had bought earlier. Kate got busy hanging all the bells and the sparkling chains all around the living room. Jim attached some neon lights to the already decorated Christmas tree and said, Hey Matt, now your tree looks complete. We were all having just a really great time. And to be honest, it was my first night out with my friends. I was having such a good time. We all sat down and started to eat our food when Matt said, Hey, what do you think about the existence of spirits? Everyone stopped eating and just kind of looked at him with a shocked look on our faces. Jim replied in a mocking tone, Oh, come on. There's no such thing as ghosts. I agreed by saying, Yeah, I don't believe in things that I can't see with my eyes. And Kate chimed in last, saying, Well, I don't believe in ghosts right now. But if I saw one, I'd probably start believing in them. Of course, I imagine all the ghosts are busy partying tonight. And with that, she started to let out a big laugh, and Jim and I joined in with her. Matt got a little embarrassed by our reaction and kept quiet for a few seconds. I looked at him and said, Hey, you got kind of serious there, but you gotta know there's no such thing as ghosts or spirits. He looked me right in my eyes and said, what if I could prove to you that there are spirits? The air in the room suddenly got very heavy, and we all started to look at each other. Nobody really knew what to say, and then Jim finally spoke up. Fine, if you can prove to me that ghosts are real, I'll buy you a soda every day for an entire year. Matt got out of his seat and quickly left the room without saying anything. A few seconds later, he came back with a candle in his hand and a cardboard box. He then dimmed the lights in the room and placed the cardboard box in the center. He lit the candle with a matchstick and said in a low voice, Well, I'm going to summon a spirit right now, and I'm going to need all of you to sit in a circle around this box. I said in a hesitant voice, Guys, are we really doing this? Isn't this a bit too much for a Christmas party? Kate looked at me and said, Oh, come on, Shelly. Nothing will happen. Let's have some fun. So we all sat quietly, just like Matt had told us. The only sound that we heard was the snowy wind hitting the glass windows and nothing else. The candlelight made the room look really spooky. Sam said in a low voice, First, we have to decide who we're going to call. We have to choose someone whom we've all seen at least once. That's when Jim said, Well, do you remember my distant cousin Tom from my last birthday? We all nodded our head in agreement. And Kate said, Yeah, that one shy boy at your birthday. I remember him. But is he dead? Jim said in a sad voice, Yeah, he kind of died from an unknown disease. I want to know what happened to him. Let's call him. I was a bit shocked to know about Jim's cousin. He was kind of a shy boy. 
He barely talked to us on his birthday. I started to feel a bit disturbed that we were actually doing something like this, but I kept quiet because I was kind of interested too. We closed our eyes and held each other's hands. Matt said in a deep, low voice, Tom, can you hear us? Nothing happened, so Matt spoke out again. Tom, we're calling out to you. Can you hear us? We want to know what happened to you. There was no sounds except for the sound of the wind outside and the clinking of the glass windows. Matt called out again. Tom, please hear us. We're calling for you. But before he could finish, the candle flickered twice and then went out on its own. The room turned pitch black and suddenly we heard a heavy knock at the main door. Kate and I almost screamed and then Matt got up and switched on the lights. Jim said in a shocking voice, Did you guys hear that or was it just me? We said that we had all heard it too. Then the knock happened again, but this time we heard a voice as well. Someone said in a tired voice, Jim, open the door man, it's too cold outside. We all got scared as we weren't expecting anyone at that time. Jim was looking even more surprised than the rest of us and he rushed to the door. As he opened the door, we all received the shock of our lives. It was Jim's distant cousin, Tom. Jim said in a gasping voice, What the hell are you doing here? Tom gave us a creepy smile and said, I came to your house to visit you for Christmas, but your mom said you were staying at Matt's, so I came here. Merry Christmas, guys. Kate got really angry and said in a loud voice, You jerk! I can't believe you lied to us like that, Jim! I hope you burn in hell, goddammit! Matt and I also hurled insults at Jim for lying to us about Tom's death. Jim laughed like an idiot and said, Sorry guys, but it's like I told you, there's no such thing as ghosts, see? And we all sat down to have another drink. Tom sat right beside us and told us about Jim's silly prank. He laughed and then said something which I thought sounded rather odd. Tom said in a deep voice, Well, you would never know if you came face to face with a ghost. I also didn't believe like you guys, but I do now. My other friends didn't really pay much attention to what he said and they all started to laugh about the entire situation. I, on the other hand, was feeling very mysterious about Tom's arrival. I looked him over from head to toe. He was wearing a full sleeve t-shirt and sweatpants. It was so freezing cold outside, how could he have managed to come here just wearing that? Also, I didn't hear the sound of a car driving in. Jim's house was at least 20 minutes away from here, so there's no way anyone could walk that distance wearing just a t-shirt and sweatpants. We all knew that Tom was a really shy guy, but the way he kept smiling with the others seemed really odd to me. His behavior was completely different, and it wasn't just his clothes, but his face looked different too. His eyes were really big and there was these dark circles under them. He was kind of looking sick to me. Suddenly, our eyes met and he smiled at me in a very creepy way and said, It seems you think a lot. I was so surprised to see him talk like that. I didn't know what to say. So I got up and went to the kitchen to wash my hands. Kate went along with me. Kate and I were talking about how weird it was to see Tom so suddenly tonight and then Matt and Jim came into the kitchen to get more booze. What's up? You two look worried. Kate and I started to tell Jim and Matt about this weird coincidence when Jim's phone rang. It was his mom. His hands were stacked with beer bottles so he asked Matt to put the phone on speaker. We heard Jim's mom crying over the phone. Jim got nervous and said, What's wrong mom? Why are you crying? Jim's mom said in a sobbing voice, Aunt Elena called. Your cousin Tom just passed away. She said Tom was in his room sleeping quietly when she heard him choking. She rushed to the room and saw him dead on the floor. His eyes were dripping out of his sockets as if he saw something horrible. Please, come home. We have to go to their house. Jim's mom couldn't say anything else and then hung up the phone. We were completely freaking out and horrified by this news. If Jim was dead, then who was sitting in Matt's living room right now? Our foreheads started to drip sweat as we all turned towards the living room. There was an empty space between the kitchen and the living room. What we saw next chilled us to our bones with terror. 
Tom was still standing in the living room, looking directly at the four of us. His eyes were coming out of his face. He smiled horribly and said in a demonic voice, You all called for me, and look, I came. Merry Christmas, guys. And he started to laugh horribly. Kate screamed and fainted on the floor. Jim cried, Oh my God. Matt and I just kept staring at Tom. We had no words. We couldn't believe our eyes. Tom started to walk towards the front door and turn to us one last time. He said in that same demonic voice, I hope you all believe now that ghosts are real. And in front of our very eyes, he disappeared into thin air. And we all sat on the floor, shattered with this horrified feeling that our one stupid prank took the life of a young person. Jim spent a lot of time in therapy after that horrible Christmas night. Kate and I never spoke about the incident again. We don't know where Matt is now because he moved out of town after that Christmas. But one thing is for sure, I sure as hell believe in ghosts now. I know you won't believe me, but as Thanksgiving New Year is knocking on the door, this memory is haunting my mind all the time. I have kept it inside for a long time. Only my family knows about this incident. One Thanksgiving, my mom took me to my grandparents' house. It was our first Thanksgiving after my dad passed away. My grandparents stayed in Canada. It was a much needed break. My mom and I were looking forward to a trip for a really long time. As we drove past the hills, the view refreshed my mind. The tall hills covered with white snow and pine trees relaxed me a bit. I looked at my mom and asked, how long will it take mom? She smiled while driving the car and said, I know Jenny that you are excited to meet your grandparents, but it will still take an hour or so. My mom was right. I have never felt so much loved by anyone in this world than my grandma and grandpa. They came to visit us many times, but this is the first time I was going to visit them. We reached in the afternoon. It was a two-storied wooden house with a beautiful garden. The garden was covered with snow, but the colorful orchards amazed my eyes. As I got down from the car, I saw grandma standing on the door, smiling at me. I could see tears in her eyes. I ran to her and hugged her. She hugged me back and caressed my cheek, saying, Oh my Jenny, we missed you so much. My grandpa came laughing and hugged my mom. We got inside. I sat down and my grandma offered me a cup of hot chocolate. The house was decorated with lights and shining Christmas bells and stars. I said in a curious voice, So this is the house where my mom grew up, huh? Trust me, mom, your house is so much better than mine. Everyone started laughing. My mom was walking all over the house, staring at it with bright eyes. I could tell she was cherishing the old memories that she once made here as a child. My grandpa asked me in a happy voice, What is your plan for Christmas, Jenny? I shrugged my shoulders, saying, I haven't decided yet. My grandpa then said, If you want, you can stay with us till Christmas. We are really happy to have you at Thanksgiving, dear. I know after your father's death, things have been tough for you, but you should know we are here for you, always. I smiled and said, I know, Grandpa. My mom said from the kitchen, Jenny, take your bags to your room. I took my bags to my room. My room was on the left side of the second floor. It has a big glass window facing the back side of the garden. As I started to arrange my clothes on the cupboard, I heard soft laughter. I turned back and the laughter stopped immediately. I looked around the room, but there wasn't anyone inside. I thought the sound might be coming from outside, so I went to the window to take a look outside. The garden was covered with snow. There were very few plants at the back of the house. The tall pine tree was standing on the ground, and just beside it there stood a well. The well was made of stone bricks. I don't know why, but I felt like checking it out. There was something about it that attracted my attention. I came down the wooden stairs. One has to go through the kitchen to get through the back door. My mom and grandma were cooking together when I entered the kitchen. I asked my grandma, 
Is that a water well, Grandma? She looked at me and said, Yes. Why? I nodded and said, Nothing. I have never seen a well before. Hence, I asked. They got busy cooking dinner, and I came out of the house using the back door. The chilly wind was tossing my hair. I stood there silently, looking at the well. The sun was about to set, but it already got dark. There was no other house nearby, only snowy fields and pine trees. As far as my eyes went, I could see snow-covered mountains. I slowly walked to the well. There was a hollow sound coming from it. As I peeked in to check the bottom of the well, I suddenly heard a scream. It was my mom's voice. She ran towards me like I was in some kind of danger and grabbed my hand to pull me away. I said in a complete state of shock, What are you doing, mom? What happened? She was breathing heavily. She said in a panicked voice, Don't you ever come near this well? Do you have any idea how deep this is? What would happen if you fell down? I calmed her down and said, Mom, I'm a college girl, not some stupid kid. I wasn't going to get that close, which would lead me to fall. Relax, Mom. She grabbed my hand and we immediately got inside. I was a bit surprised to see her reaction. She behaved as if I was a little child. After dinner, she got all normal, but this uneasy feeling about this well stayed inside me. The turkey was delicious. I ate so much that I could barely walk. I looked at my grandma and said, This is the best Thanksgiving turkey I ever had, grandma. Her eyes dazzled with joy, hearing praises. My mom poured herself a glass of wine and sat near the fireplace. Though she was behaving normally, I could tell from her eyes that something was disturbing her. She was being aloof amidst conversations, as if her mind sometime went somewhere else. I sat close to her and said in a soft voice, Mom, are you okay? She held my hand and tears came down from her eyes. I was surprised. She then said in a sad voice, I have already lost a lot. I can't afford to lose you, Jenny. Promise me you will always take care of yourself. I realized that she was missing my dad. After all, it was Thanksgiving. So I hugged her and said, Yes, Mom. I took her to her room so that she could sleep. She was already tired of the entire journey. I wished my grandparents good night, and we all went to our room to sleep. Around midnight, I heard a knocking sound. The sound was like someone was knocking on the glass. As I opened my eyes, I saw a small girl standing outside the window with a sweet smile. She chuckled at me and called me by moving her small fingers. I heard the same laugh in the afternoon when I was arranging my cupboard. I came down from the stairs. As I opened the back door, I saw that little girl standing under the pine tree. She was waving at me and chuckling in a sweet voice. I said, standing at the door, Hey, you should not be roaming around late nights in the snow. You'll get sick. Are you lost? She then stopped laughing and stared at me for a while, then nodded her head from right to left, gesturing, No. I again said, Then why are you out so late? Where do you stay? She again stared at me and looked at the well. I couldn't understand what she was trying to say. I started walking towards her as she stood under the tree. Her clothes were filled with muddy prints and torn out at some places. I was really shocked to see her in this shivering cold wearing nothing but this worn out dress. I was only five hands away from her when she again looked up at the house. Out of curiosity, I followed her eyes and saw my bedroom window. A cold shiver went down my spine. I recalled seeing this girl knocking on my bedroom window. But this is a two-storied house. How the hell a tiny girl like her can climb such heights without any help? I slowly turned towards the pine tree and saw that the girl wasn't there. As I shifted my eyes on the right, I saw that girl standing on the edge of the well. She looked at me with the same blank expression. Her eyes were wide and her pupils were so small, almost like a dot. She then smiled and jumped into the well within a blink. I screamed in horror. My mom and grandparents rushed immediately, hearing my scream. I started to sob terribly. 
They took me inside and gave me a glass of water. After drinking the water, I was finally able to speak. I told them everything I saw. I looked at my mom and said, Mom, we need to save that girl. But her face looked pale. She was more scared than worried after hearing all these. She busted into tears, saying, I shouldn't have brought you here, Jenny. I thought maybe after all these years, she would have finally left, but I was so wrong. I wasn't understanding a single word coming out of her mouth. I said in a panicked voice, What do you mean, Mom? Do you know this girl? Will anyone fucking tell me what's going on here? My grandparents made me calm down and explained to me what really happened. I still get goosebumps when I think about what they told me. My mom was 16 years old when she got pregnant with her high school boyfriend. She gave birth to a beautiful little girl in my room. Though the guy broke up with her for not being able to handle such a situation, my mom decided to raise her daughter by herself. On one Thanksgiving night, when the girl was just two years old, came out of the house. It was snowing outside, and she got busy catching snowflakes falling from the sky. Out of excitement, she carelessly got near the well and slipped. She died falling in that well. My grandparents couldn't find her body, as the well is too deep to search. Since then, every Thanksgiving night, she comes to visit this house. Since then, my mom never came to this house. This time she thought things might get different, but it didn't. My grandparents sold that house and moved to a new house after that incident, but my mom still doesn't go out at Thanksgiving. It aches my heart too, knowing that I lost my sister even before I could know her. Lily picked up the phone and heard her mother's voice. Your sister is already here. When are you coming? Lily said in a comforting voice, Mom, you know my shift ends at 6 p.m. I'll be home soon. Now stop calling me every minute. Missy heard her and said, Christmas is the most exciting time of year. I wanted so long for the holidays to come. Lily smiled and started to finish her work. Lily works in a consumer service forum. Being a young, pretty woman, she's almost everybody's favorite around the workplace. Her co-worker, Missy, is her all-time favorite companion at work. Everyone in the office was already in a mood for celebration. The office was decorated with all kinds of Christmas items, such as lights, stockings, garlands, hanging icicles, figurines, balls, stars, and much more. Almost all the employees were wearing a smile on their face. Lily was extremely excited about the holidays. After a long time, her sister had come to visit with her fiancé. Now, everyone was waiting for only Lily to arrive. They all would be leaving for Switzerland tomorrow. Clouds of happiness were waiting for Lily. After all, it's Christmas Eve. Lily finished typing her letters and went to submit them to her boss. After coming back to her desk, Missy came to her with an overly excited face. Lily smiled and asked, oh, Now what? Missy blushed and said, I just heard our boss discussing with the manager about distributing the secret Santa gifts. Oh, really? I thought we'd all grown out of that kind of a silly game, said Lily in a mocking tone. Oh, come on. You can still grow up and receive secret Santa gifts. You're such a spoil sport, Lily. Lily laughed and said, yeah, I know. You've got too many suitors in this office who are surely dying to give gifts to you. Missy laughed and replied, That goes for you too, you social butterfly. Both of them started to chuckle in excitement. <laughs> Every year, their office arranges this secret Santa game. People who admire someone can give gifts to that person in secret. But no one can know who gave which gift to whom. Mostly it's chocolate or pieces of jewelry for the girls. Lily always gets them every Christmas. This year it will be the same too. After lunch, everyone was called to the cafeteria where the boss, Mr. Watson, wished everyone a Merry Christmas and announced that the secret Santa gifts will be placed on everyone's desk during the lunch break. After returning from lunch, every employee will find their Christmas gifts on their desk. Missy and Lily went to get their lunch and discuss their holiday plans. Around 3.30, everyone had gotten back from lunch. 
It was the last day before the Christmas holidays, so the work pressure was quite a bit less. Generally, Lily happened to work till around 8 o'clock at night. As Lily reached her desk, she saw five or six gift boxes. Everyone was unboxing their gifts and wishing each other a Merry Christmas. Lily received chocolates and fancy jewelry, just like every year. She still had one box left to open when Missy came by her desk. Lily opened the box and got a real surprise. Inside, there was a heart-shaped diamond pendant. Missy said with dazzling eyes, Wow, that's a little expensive for a secret Santa gift. Someone must have a serious crush on you, Lily. And she started to laugh in that same old way. Lily held the pendant in her hand and said in a worried voice, I don't know if I should take it or not. This is really expensive. Who would buy such a gift for me? Missy peeked inside the gift box and said, Look, there's a note inside it. Lily took the note and read it. Would you like to have dinner with me for Christmas? Lily started to blush like a teenager. Missy constantly pulled her leg. She had to admit she was enjoying the attention. Hence Lily said in an excited voice, If I knew who my secret Santa is, I would surely cancel all my plans just to have dinner with him. Missy and Lily started to laugh again. As time passed, everyone started to leave the office. People were finishing up their work as soon as they could and leaving for the holidays. Around 5.30, Missy came to bid goodbye to Lily. She wished her a happy holidays and left. The office was almost empty. Lily was almost done with all her work. There were just a few basic formalities left before she left for the holidays. She wrapped her things up and went to get a soda from the cafeteria before leaving. Just as she inserted her dollar bill and pressed the button on the soda machine, the entire office lost power. Oh God, not today. She turned on the flashlight on her phone and rushed to her desk. The entire area was empty. There was no one else on the office floor. Lily started to get very worried because the exit doors work on a card punching machine. Without electricity, only the security guards can help people to pass through the doors. She took up her bags and tried to call the security from the office phone. But it was Christmas Eve and the phone kept ringing and ringing and no one answered. Lily looked down at her phone and saw that it only had 3% charge remaining. She felt like an idiot for not plugging her phone into a charger. Without wasting a single second, she called her mom. Hello, mom? Uh, I got stuck in the office, her mom said. But you said you'd be done by six, Lily, her mom replied in an angry tone. No, not because of work. There's been a power outage. I need you to call 911 for me. But before she could finish her sentence, she noticed that her call got disconnected. Lily thought to herself that now her mom will think she got stuck at work. What a great way to start the holidays. Lily had no idea what she could do. But suddenly, she thought of a plan. The maintenance department was kept downstairs. Someone would surely still be there. Without any delay, Lily ran down the stairs. The maintenance department was equally dark, just like upstairs. She couldn't see anything except the long, empty passage lying ahead of her. Lily was just about to start crying when she saw a flashlight coming towards her. She almost screamed in relief. Hey! Oh, thank God! A man came up to her with a flashlight. Lily had seen this guy earlier. He had only recently joined the workplace, but she had never talked to him. The guy was wearing glasses. He was a man of average height and had a simple face. He smiled in a shy manner and said, Oh, I'm sorry if I've scared you. Actually, I was just about to leave when the power cut off, so I thought I'd check upstairs in case someone was still stuck there. Lily smiled and replied, I'm just so relieved to see you. I thought I'd gotten stuck all alone inside this office when the power was out. The guy smiled and said, Well, it's really lonely to be lonely. Lily nodded her head, hearing such a weird thing, and said, I think we should call 911 because I think the office security people have left too. The guy said hesitantly, Yes, I was just about to call them. By the way, I I'm Alan. If you want to, we can wait this out in my cabin. I've lit some candles there. Lily started to walk with Alan to his cabin, and then she asked him, So, what are your plans for this holiday? To which Alan replied, Right now, 
I'm just hoping to have dinner. As Lily stepped inside Alan's cabin, she got a surprise. There were two candles on his desk, and his cabin was nicely decorated too. Lily said in an impressive tone, Wow, you did some good decorating. This cabin is so romantic. She noticed Alan get a bit shy. They both sat down and Alan offered her some water. Lily took a sip and said, Did you make the call? Alan said in a hesitant voice, Yes, yeah, yes, I, I was just going to. He then quickly picked up his phone and called 911 to report the entire situation and the power outage. Lily sat there quietly until Alan ended the phone call. After the phone call, Alan sat down in his chair and said, Are you feeling hungry? I've got some spaghetti and meatballs with me. Lily felt a bit weird and said, Why did you bring such heavy food? Weren't we all going to be leaving for the holidays today? Alan started acting a bit awkward and said, I don't know what I was thinking. I had just packed something to have in the office for today, but forgot to eat lunch and went out and grabbed some hot dogs. Then they started to both laugh awkwardly. Lily noticed Alan wasn't all that worried about getting stuck in the office during Christmas Eve. In fact, he was being quite casual about the whole matter. Lily asked Alan, So, what did you get in your secret Santa? Alan sighed and said, Oh, I don't think people really like me. Not everyone is as popular as you, right Lily? Lily smiled awkwardly at his comment and looked at the wall clock. It read 6.30. She was surprised to see that 911 was taking so much time to get help here. Suddenly, her eyes went to the paper lying on the desk. It was a note which had some basic office information scribbled on it. She recognized the handwriting. It was exactly like the handwriting from her secret Santa note today. A cold shiver went down her spine. She softly asked, Um, Alan, if you don't mind, could you bring me some ice from the freezer in the cafeteria? I kind of bumped into my desk in the dark and hurt my knee. Alan immediately stood up with a smile on his face and said, Of course, anything you need. I'll be right back. As soon as Alan left, Lily sprinted over to his phone and opened it. Oh, thank God it wasn't password protected. She checked the call logs and discovered the dark truth. There was no record of a call going to 911. Alan hadn't called the cops. Drops of sweat started to appear on her forehead. She immediately called 911. Once the cop picked up, she said in a tensed voice, Hello, please help me. I've been trapped in an office by a guy. He's a psycho. I have no idea what he's up to. Please, come as soon as you can. Our office address is... But she couldn't finish her sentence because she heard a thud sound come from behind her. Her eyes froze in fear. She knew something horrible was about to happen. She slowly turned her head and saw Alan was standing at the doorway, looking fiercely at her. The ice bucket was lying on the floor. Alan's eyes looked fucking creepy. There was anger written all over his face. He said in a stuttering voice, You... you played me, huh? Can't trust you. Women. At all. Why were you so hyped up to leave this office? You only said this afternoon that you would happily cancel all your plans just to have dinner with me. Lily took a few steps back and said in a frightened voice, I didn't mean it that way, Alan. I hardly know you. Listen, we should get out of this place. We can talk later and try to get to know each other first. She reached into her bag and took out the diamond pendant. She raised her hands towards Alan and said, You know, you can keep this for now. It wouldn't be nice of me to take such an expensive gift. Alan started to laugh hysterically <laughs> and then screamed at her in furious anger. Why? Because I'm not good enough for you? Lily was in tears. Her hands were shaking. She couldn't move her legs. Alan started to walk like a maniac and growl and scream. He kicked the glass door of his cabin so hard that the glass shattered with a loud noise. There was broken glass all over the floor. Lily screamed in fear and sat in the corner of the room. Alan looked at her and said in a spine-chilling voice, You know, I can give you so much more than this stupid pendant. I can give you the best Christmas gift in the world. You want me to show you how much you matter to me, right? Fine then. What Alan did next was completely unexpected. Lily didn't see it coming at all. Alan picked up broken glass from the floor and started to cut himself up. Ah! 
He started by slashing his wrists. Blood was pouring like a fountain onto the white floor. Lily kept screaming, seeing such a vicious sight. Then Alan brought out the ultimate horror that would curse Lily for the rest of her life. He steadied his eyes and stared directly at her and said, I loved you from the first day I saw you, Lily. I hoped that you would like me too, but I was never enough for anyone. Then he took the glass and sliced his throat in front of her. Lily screamed in horror and fainted to the floor. Worried about her not returning home, Lily's mother had called 911. When the cops came, they discovered Lily lying unconscious on the floor and Alan lying dead in a pool of his own blood. It was then discovered that Alan had intentionally shut off the power in order to trap Lily inside the office. Christmas would never be the same again for Lily. She would get nightmares that Alan was standing in front of her with that angry, hurtful face and blood gushing out of his wrists and neck. The Night at the Motel Kim and David were having breakfast on a sunny Sunday morning, sitting at their house. David said to Kim, How about we visit our family farmhouse for this weekend? The weather is nice. It will be an amazing road trip. Kim's face lightened up in joy, and she replied, Wow, that's a great idea. I will pack our things. We will leave in the afternoon tomorrow. It has been five years since Kim and David got married. Both of them enjoy traveling more than anything else. Every weekend, they plan small trips by road. This week won't be different from that plan either. The next day, around 1 p.m., David and Kim started on the road. The farmhouse was six hours drive. David turned on the music in the car and said, We will reach around 7, 7.30 p.m. Kim said, Did you tell the watchman that we are coming? David nodded his head, gesturing yes. The view was breathtaking. Kim pulled down the glass of her window. Cold, fresh wind touched her face, and she felt so relaxed. As far as the eyes went, there were vast green fields and rocky mountains. Birds were flying high in the sky. Both of them were enjoying the serene start of their weekend. Kim packed cheese sandwiches and some fries. She took out the food and handed some over to David. David stopped near a turn, and they got out of the car to take a break. Kim looked at her phone. The signal was getting pretty weak. They were standing in wild nature. The high mountains and vast green fields were their only companion now. They laughed and chuckled while enjoying their sandwiches. No one realized how time passed. It was 6 p.m. and got dark. David told Kim, let's hurry up. We still have three hours distance to cover. Kim fell asleep on the way. David was driving on the wide, empty highway. He looked at his GPS and realized he was in the right direction. He needed to take a left turn after 15 minutes. Just when he was about to take the turn, something came under the car and the tires punctured, making a loud noise and heavy jerking. Kim woke up with a shock and said, Oh my God, what happened? David somehow managed the speeding car from bumping onto the nearby tree. The car stopped with a terrible creaking sound. He got down under the car and started to yell in anger. Bloody hell! Who the fuck did this, dude? Morons! <sighs> Kim got a bit tensed seeing David burst out in anger, looking at the car tires. She too came down and realized David's sudden outburst is perfectly justified. Someone left broken glasses of beer bottles on the road. Some of the big pieces still have the labels of the beer brand on it. Kim said in a worried voice, Oh no, what will we do now? I don't think we will find any gas station nearby. David kicked on the punctured tire and said in an angry voice, Bloody hell! Being helpless in the middle of nowhere, the couple locked the car and started walking with their backpacks. They already knew that the left turn leading to the farmhouse is an empty road. They won't find any help in that way. So they walked ahead. They thought to come across a car that can take them to a nearby gas station. After half an hour, Kim said in a tired voice, My legs are hurting now. I'm too tired to walk now. David said in a worried voice, I think we made a mistake by leaving the car. We should have stayed inside the car because... 
before he could finish his sentence. Kim cried in joy. Look, it's a signboard. David followed Kim's direction and saw a signboard was blinking at the right side of the road in the near distance. They started to walk faster. It was a roadside motel. Small cabins were lying on a wooden deck. A small hut stood on the left side. The door was opened. The interior seemed like a counter. There was no one there. There was a room behind the counter. The door was closed. David said in a hesitant tone, Anyone here? Anybody? Kim looked around and said, I think the owner is asleep in that room. Should we wake him up? David walked past the counter. He was about to twist the doorknob, just when someone spoke in a spine-chilling soft voice. Looking for a night shelter, guys? Kim and David turned towards the exit quickly and saw an average height man standing at the doorway. The man had messy hair and a creepy face. His eyes were excessively bright and wide. He smiled mysteriously and said, That's my room. I can let you stay there, you know and started to laugh in a broken voice. David came to the other side of the counter and stood beside Kim. The man went to the counter and kept staring at them with his wide eyes. Kim said, We would like a room for the night. Our car got punctured. The man took out a rusty keychain and said, That's sad to hear. Room 101 for you. There's no food available here but you can get snacks and drinks from the machines at the end of the deck. Kim took the keys and walked away. David asked, How much for one night? The man replied, Ten dollars, but you can pay later as well. David was in no mood to extend the conversation with this guy, so he left a ten dollar bill on the counter and left. Room 101 had a double bed, a small table at the right side corner of the bed, two chairs, and a really big mirror on the wall. The bathroom also had a mirror. Kim got all freshened up, but she couldn't shake off the feeling that there is something really weird here. The couple was very tired from the exhaustion of the entire day, so they fell asleep quickly. Around midnight, Kim heard a beeping sound coming from the room somewhere and woke up. She got up and started to look for the sound. David was sleeping like a dead person, so he didn't realize any of this. After searching for a few seconds, Kim realized that the sound was coming from the wall. She walked close to the wall and found out that the sound was actually coming behind the mirror. She went to turn on the light, just when she noticed a small red light blinking behind the mirror. The light was visible only because of the darkness in the room. Kim pushed the mirror and she realized it is just hanging from that wall. Next, what happened gave a terrible shock to her. She took off the mirror and saw there's a small camera hidden inside a hole in the wall. The moment she understood they were being watched all this time, she rushed to the bed and woke David up. Wake up, David. We can't stay here. We have to leave. She started to panic. David woke up and listened to the entire matter for him. Someone hit this camera in the wall, and the battery of this camera went dead, which is why it made a beeping sound. David got angry as hell and rushed towards the counter. The man was not there. Kim kept yelling, Please just leave. Let's go now. David didn't listen to her and bolted into the room next to the counter. As he opened the door, his eyes got transfixed in fear. The room was like a large concrete dungeon. There were huge glass tubes filled with some boiling liquid inside it. But that's not the only thing they saw in that room. Inside each glass tube, there was a dead body. It seemed like someone is preserving them because some bodies looked quite old as the skins were coming off. Kim wanted to scream, but her conscience told her that the only right thing to do now is to leave this hellhole as quietly as possible. Without wasting any more time, David and Kim ran out the room. Just when they reached outside, their blood turned cold. The man was standing on the exit of the counter. He had a sharp knife in his hand. He lifted his face and opened his big wide eyes. His stare was like a hungry wolf. Saliva was dripping from his mouth. He took the knife 
and licked the blade with his tongue in a very bizarre way and started to chuckle. He then said, how do you like my personal collection? Kim was already in tears. She grabbed David's hand tightly. David was afraid too, but he said in a loud voice, you're one sick psycho. Once we get out of here, the cops will show you your right place, you maniac. The man laughed again and said, but first, you have to get out of here. And that too, alive. What happened next happened so quick that Kim still remembers it in fragments. The man came onto David with his long, sharp knife. But David was already prepared for such a moment. He knocked the man out with a strong punch to his face. Blood spattered from his mouth and he fell on the floor, unconscious. David took the man up and locked him inside room 101. They called 911 with the phone on the counter. After an hour, two cops arrived and the entire matter shocked the hell out of them too. They arrested the man and discovered a bunch of horrifying information. The man was a psycho killer. He used to trap cars on the highway by deliberately placing broken beer bottles on the road. After being helpless in the middle of nowhere, many travelers came to his motel asking for a one night stay. He placed a secret camera behind the room mirrors to keep an eye on them. When they finally fell deeply asleep, he used to sneak into their room and stab them to death. The man had the same plan for David and Kim too. That's why he went to sharpen his knife after seeing them asleep from the secret camera. Thankfully, the camera ran out of battery and Kim woke up at the right moment. For at least two to three months, Kim remained terrified about spending nights at unknown motels during vacation. David still checks out the mirrors and every nook and corner of hotel rooms whenever they go on vacation. The memories of this incident are very fresh as it happened last week. Winter is the season of relaxing ourselves at home but this year's winter gave me a really hard time at the very beginning of it. I stay in Montana on my own. It's been almost five years now I have moved out and made a life for myself. Due to the winter season, most people in my neighborhood were either out for holidays or went to visit their families. I also planned to visit my parents, but due to the unavailability of flights, I couldn't. My plan for this Christmas was to eat junk food watch movies and drink wine as much as possible. But this sudden incident from last week has turned my world upside down. It was a cold winter evening. I opened my door to look out. The whole locality was covered in snow. Streetlights were glowing in the dark. There wasn't a single person on the streets. I got a bit upset about being alone. Just then, I received a call from my dad. He said, all good, Kim? I know you are upset. Your mother and I are going to visit you soon. His words put a smile on my face and I replied, how did you know I was feeling upset? My dad smiled and said in a caring tone, that's what dads do, my dear. I talked to them for a while, then hung up the phone and went to the kitchen to prepare dinner. Around 9 p.m., I was eating my dinner sitting at my dining table. Now, the table is placed near a glass window. I always prefer this spot for eating or working. The entire view of the street and houses nearby are visible from this window. While I was eating, I saw the snowfall had started. It was a pretty sight to watch. I was enjoying the view outside when suddenly my doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone at this hour. I stood up slowly and walked to the main door. As I peeped from the eye hole, I saw a man wearing a black hoodie standing outside. I asked, hey, who are you? The man took off his hoodie and said with a big smile, here's your food, ma'am. He then lifted up his right hand. There was a brown paper bag like those takeaway packaging. Without opening the door, I replied in a confused tone, but I didn't order any food. You must have come to the wrong address. The man looked at his phone and said, this is 22 CR Avenue, right? I replied, yes. The street is right, but what is the house number? The man now scratched his head and said, Um, they told me the house on the right. Your house is the only house nearby with its lights on, so I guessed this is the one. 
The man was of average height, but very bony. I could spot his facial bones underneath his skinny face. His eyes were extremely big and bright. He didn't seem like a delivery guy. I asked him, which restaurant are you coming from? Suddenly, he seemed all confused and I could tell from the pause that he was lying. He fumbled and said, Well, I'm from... Can you just please open the door and check for yourself? I have the complete bill on my phone. Now, my suspicion grew even more. Why couldn't he just say the name of the restaurant unless he is lying about this entire food delivery thing? I said in a strict voice, Look, I am telling you, I didn't order any food. Please just leave now. The man gave a cold look and lifted up his hoodie and left. I came back to the table. The entire awkward encounter made me quite uncomfortable. I couldn't help but think, was he really a delivery guy or was he just making it all up? I finished my dinner and once again went to check the lock on my door. I was just setting the alarm standing near the door when someone knocked. I got close and looked at the eye hole. It was that same guy. I said in an irritated voice, What are you doing here? I already said this is not the house you were looking for. The man replied in a hesitant voice, Sorry to bother you, ma'am, but my bike is not starting. I tried calling the food station. My phone battery is dead, too. Can I please come in and use your phone? The entire street was empty, and there was no way I was letting this guy inside. But I thought to myself, what if he's telling the truth and he really needs help? I was thinking about what to do right now, but suddenly a doubt popped in my mind. I could see the streets from the eye hole behind this guy, but there wasn't any bike parked nearby. I asked in a doubtful tone, Where is your bike? He said in the same hesitated voice. I, I have parked on the side. If you open the door, I can show you my ID too. I don't know why, but I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling about this guy. Also, the way he was pleading me to open the door seemed really odd. I remembered there's a payphone nearby. I said spontaneously, I just remembered there's a payphone nearby. You can use that, you know. So far, the guy was being somewhat polite and hesitant. But what happened next made my heart skip to my throat. The guy broadened his angry eyes and said in a rusty, threatening voice, You can just open the door, you little bitch. My body froze in fear. I could see him breathing like a hungry wolf standing at my doorway. I said in a scared voice, What? What did you just say to me? The guy said in the same rough voice, Just open the door and let me in. Open the door. Open, open, open. He then started to bang on the door like a maniac. I was terrified and almost broke down in tears. There was no one in the locality to come to help right now. I got my shit together and screamed in a loud voice. Listen, you asshole, if you don't back off from my door right now, I'm going to call the cops and make sure you rot in jail for harassing me all this time. The sound of banging on the door stopped immediately. Everything became completely silent for a moment. Then I heard the sound of footsteps on the snow fading away. I rushed to the door and looked from the eye hole. I saw the guy walking away and eventually, he disappeared in the dark street. I heaved a sigh of relief. I didn't call 911 because I thought I had managed to scare him off. I came back to my table and sat down. Even on the cold winter night, I was sweating like a dog. I wiped my face with my hand and poured myself a glass of water. I drank water, and the next 20 minutes went without any further trouble. I was calmed down finally and sat near the television to watch a movie. I wanted to take my mind off this creepy and scary encounter. I didn't realize when I dozed off on the couch while watching the movie, a sound woke me up. The sound was coming from the main door. I rubbed my eyes and stared at the door. A sense of fear grabbed me. The doorknob was moving as if someone was twisting it from the outside. I could tell someone is trying to break in. I was completely sure that this was the same creepy guy. I didn't want to make any noise. I wanted him to think that I had fallen asleep, so I slowly got up and went to the table to get my phone. I was adamant this time. I wanted to teach him a lesson for life, so I made up my mind to call the cops. I reached the table, 
picked up my phone. I slowly walked to the door just to check what he is up to right now. As I went to peep through the eye hole, I immediately sprung back in horror. There was already an eye on the eye hole from the outside. The guy was trying to look inside my house. I don't know what he saw, but he backed out a little and said with a spine chilling stare, I know you are awake. I can hear your heavy warm breath. My hands were shaking. I was completely terrified. Gathering all the courage inside me, I said in a firm voice, I'm going to teach you a lesson now. I walked to the table, sat down, and calmed myself. I then dialed 911 and reported how a fucking creepy guy is harassing me for a long time and right now trying to break in. The cop at the station told me to hold on and be brave. The roads are covered with snow, so it might take 15 to 20 minutes for them to arrive. Needless to say, I was shit scared but I didn't want to let this guy take control over my fear, so I said out loud, Just wait, you freaking jerk. The cops are coming to get you. A few minutes passed silently. There was no sound of him. Suddenly, I heard a strange sound on my glass window. Something inside me was telling me to go to my room and lock the door until the cops arrive, but I couldn't stop myself to check what's going on right now. Just when I pulled my window curtains, I fell on the floor screaming at the top of my lungs. I don't think I will be able to get sleep for at least a couple of weeks from what I saw next. That bony, creepy guy was standing near my glass window and looking at me with his hungry eyes. His face was cold and cruel. He then did something very bizarre. He got really close to the glass and started to lick it horrifyingly. The entire scene was beyond any worst nightmare any of you will ever see. I started sobbing. I was shaken by the situation. I was praying to God for the cops to arrive just when I heard the car's siren. The man looked at the street and then looked at me. He gave a blood freezing ear to ear smile and said, do you know what would look good on you? Crutches. He then walked away. I don't know how I should be feeling right now. I don't know what that guy's problem was. I just know he is a filth walking over the society making women feel miserable and unsafe. The cops searched the area and obviously couldn't find any trace of him. I am now staying at one of my colleagues' house. My parents are coming tomorrow to get me. I don't know if I will ever be able to go back to my house. Even if I do, sitting at my favorite spot will be my biggest nightmare. Two years ago, when I was 15, my parents decided to go visit my uncle. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay home and hang out with my best friend Alex. Since we live in a quiet neighborhood and there was little crime happening here, my parents allowed me to stay home and have Alex come over. My mom left me a note on the fridge with all emergency numbers and my dad told me to call him if anything happens. I assured them that everything is going to be fine. Me and Alex were just going to play video games and have some pizza later. They both hugged me and left. I called Alex and he came to my house 50 minutes later. We played UFC on my PS4 for two hours and then had some pizza. After our meal, we just sat in my living room talking about random stuff. Eventually, we started talking about girls. We both had crushes on some older girls but the girls didn't even know we existed. Alex mentioned a website where you could talk to random people called Amigle. He also said that he talked to some girls there. So we decided to go on Amigle and try our luck. The first 30 minutes, we didn't get matched with any girls, so we started to get bored. And just when I moved my mouse to exit the site, two girls showed up on our screen. They were about our age maybe a little older. We started talking to them, but they were just typing. We could see that they were talking, but we couldn't hear them. We told them to turn on their microphone, but the girl said that they don't have a microphone. We continued talking to them. We said that we were home alone, and so were they. They said that they lived in the same city and the same area as Alex and I, but we never saw them. After 15 more minutes, they said that we were cute and that we should hang out sometime. We were stunned. 
girls usually didn't want to hang out with us, so Alex gave them his Snapchat username. As soon as he typed his username, the girls disconnected. We were really bummed out. We didn't even get their names, so we just turned off my laptop and went back on the PS4 to play some video games. Some time passed. We were still playing video games when Alex took out his phone. He just received a snap message from someone called Anna XOXO99. He opened it and it was a picture of the two girls we met on Omegle earlier. They were walking on the street and the caption said, Can we come over and hang out? Alex immediately looked at me. He didn't ask me anything. I already knew what he wanted and I said no. They can't come to my house. He wasn't happy about this, but I said no every time he tried to make me let them come over. Alex texted them saying that they can't come and that we should hang out some other time. A couple minutes later, the girls responded, Can we meet at the park then? Alex asked me if I wanted to go to the park. It was only 10 minutes of walking from my house. And I said no. He called me a pussy and said that he was going with or without me. Maybe he was right. Maybe I am a pussy. Am I going to pass on an opportunity like this? I looked at my watch. It was 10.30 p.m. So it wasn't that late. And my dad's friend lives right next to the park. So I thought it was okay. But if anything seemed strange, we would immediately go back to my place. Alex agreed. He sent the girls a snap saying that we were on our way to the park. They replayed the snap from Alex that we should meet and told us that they were waiting for us in the children's playground. We got out of my house and we started walking to the park. The whole walk there, I was thinking, what if something goes wrong? We don't even know these girls and what if someone else was at the park with them? I didn't want to say anything to Alex because he would probably say that I was a pussy and that I'm paranoid, so I kept my thoughts to myself. After 10 minutes of walking, we got to the park. The children's playground was a little deep in the park, so I asked Alex to ask them to come to the main entrance of the park because we were already there. Alex just said, dude, come on, and texted them that we are in the park. A minute or so, we arrived at the playground. There was no one there. I asked Alex if they responded to our last snap, and he said no, they just left it on red. We waited there for a couple of minutes, but there was no sign of the girls. We were all alone in the park. I told Alex that they probably were just messing with us, and that we should go home. But Alex wanted to stay a couple of minutes more. A minute passed, and we heard someone walking behind us. We turned around, and there was a guy dressed in black, standing behind a tree, looking at us, and he had a creepy smile on his face. I said to Alex that we should go home and that this wasn't a good idea. Alex agreed, and we started walking back home. The whole time, I was looking over my shoulder, trying to see if the man was following us, and he was. So I said to Alex to step up. Just when we got to the park's entrance, the guy grabbed my hand and started screaming in some insane way. I was screaming and kicking <laughs> trying to get him to let go of my hand. I was calling Alex to help me, but he ran away. The guy started pulling me back into the park. I was screaming as loud as I could, and that was when I saw blue and red lights. The guy must have seen them too because he immediately let go of my hand and ran deeper into the park. I started running back to the direction of my house when a police officer stopped me. I explained everything to him and he called my parents. The police officer took me to the police station to wait for my parents to pick me up. My parents came after one hour and the police told them what happened and so did I. My dad asked them did they catch the guy from the park and they said they were still looking for him. When we got home, my parents were glad that nothing serious happened, but they were still mad because I left the house to meet some girls I was talking to online.
they told us to go to sleep and that everything will be alright. The next day, Alex came to my house with his dad and he apologized for running away last night. He also said that when he got home, he opened his Snapchat and there was no sign of Anna XOXO99 and it was like she never existed. From that day on, I never went back on Amigle. Cherry and her little brother were running excitedly around the house because it was Christmas morning. She was very excited as they were going to go visit their uncle this Christmas. Cherry's mother came to the living room and told her to pack her bags as early as possible. It was going to be a five hour drive amidst the mountains, so they had to leave early. Cherry's brother Bob was always throwing tantrums. She went over to him and said, you must hurry up or mom will be very angry with us. I'm so excited to meet auntie and uncle. Auntie Helena said she's going to make chocolate custard for Christmas tonight. Bob made a funny face and said, I'll eat all the custard and you'll get nothing. Cherry started to scream and said, oh, shut up. Their mother, Kathy, said from the bedroom, oh, stop it, you two. We're already running late. John put the luggage in his car trunk and said, Kathy, hurry up, we have to leave now, or it'll be dark before we reach your brother's house. Cherry feels like Christmas is her most favorite time of the year. So they all hopped in their car and started their journey. As they were driving among the mountains and pine trees, as far as their eyes went, they could see white snow covering nature all around them. Bob was busy playing with his Santa and elf toys. Suddenly, Cherry asked him, What do you want for Christmas this year? Bob replied, I've asked for a gumball machine and a huge house made of candies and cream biscuits. Everyone started to laugh upon hearing his childish Christmas wishes. Cherry laughed and said, but to get your Christmas gift, you have to be good for the entire year, which you obviously haven't. The way you mess with my toys and things, I think this year, instead of Santa, Krampus will visit you. Bob got really angry and started a fight with Cherry. Kathy managed to stop them and asked Cherry in a surprised voice, How do you know about Krampus? To which she replied, that their English teacher taught them whoever hasn't behaved nicely throughout the year will be punished by Krampus. John said in a surprised voice, Who's Krampus? Cherry replied, Krampus is a half-goat, half-demon monster that punishes children who misbehave on Christmas. He's the devilish companion of Saint Nicholas. Children who did not listen to their parents or elders will be whipped and beaten by Krampus. Kathy replied in a comforting voice, Oh, I'm sure this is just an old scary story that your teacher told you, Cherry. There's no such thing as Krampus. Cherry thought to herself, If Santa Claus is real, then why can't Krampus be real? But... She didn't say anything as her brother was already crying upon hearing about this demon goat. Kathy gave Bob some chocolate and told him to be nice when they reached their uncle's house. Around 5 o'clock, they finally reached Uncle Sam's house. Uncle Sam hugged Bob and Cherry in his arms and led them inside. Aunt Helena came over and hugged Cherry and wished her a Merry Christmas. They all sat down near the fireplace and started to chat. Their house was beautifully decorated with Christmas items. Shining bells were hanging from the ceiling and neon lights were sparkling all over the walls. Cherry was amazed to see the huge Christmas tree placed in the middle of the living room. It was filled with lights, crystal balls, jingle bells, and all the glittering things in the world. 
Cherry turned to her Uncle Sam and said in an excited voice that she loved their house and that they had the most beautiful Christmas tree in the whole world. Everyone was delighted to hear such sweet words coming from a seven-year-old girl. Bob was busy unwrapping the gift sitting under the Christmas tree. Just then, his father said, Bob, you should open your gift with your sister. But he didn't listen. As the night went on, the celebrations grew even more. The table was filled with delicious dishes. An entire turkey was roasting and placed in the middle of the table. There were custards, mashed potatoes, fries, porridge, and Cherry's favorite, chicken rice. After dinner, Cherry sat down on the couch and started to open her Christmas present. It was a beautiful gown. She started to dance in joy and said, I knew Santa would fulfill my wish. But on the other hand, Bob started to cry, saying, I didn't ask for a remote-controlled car. Where's my gumball machine? Everyone started to get busy and decided to ignore the little child. <laughs> Cherry went to her little brother and said, Let's play hide and clap. She knew Bob loves to play hide and clap, hence it will help to distract him for some time. The house was quite big, so they had lots of places to hide. As they began their game, Kathy said, No one will leave the house. Stay inside and play whatever you like. It's really cold outside. Cherry could see the snow-covered ground from the large glass window upstairs. There was even a snowman near the house gate. A heavy wind was blowing outside, which made the glass window vibrate while making a clinking sound. As the game began, Cherry decided to hide first, and Bob would be the one looking for her. Cherry hid inside Aunt Helena's bedroom closet, and Bob started to count from 1 to 10. After he was done counting, he said in a loud voice, Give me the first clap! The first clap took place, and Bob immediately followed it. After the second clap, he managed to find Cherry and yelled in joy, I win! I win! Cherry said, The game's not over yet! Now it's my turn! You go hide. Bob wanted to win this game any way he could, so he went and hid in the attic. He stood near the attic window, waiting for Cherry's counting to end. The attic was dark, and the howling winds outside started to scare him. Suddenly, he looked out of the window and saw a man wearing a big red cloak standing beside the snowman. Bob got very excited, thinking that Santa Claus had finally come to visit them. He opened the glass window and yelled out in a cheery voice, Santa, I'm here! Did you bring me my gumball machine? The man wearing the red cloak waved his hand and nodded. Bursting in joy, Bob silently got down from the attic and sneaked out of the house. He opened the main door, making less sound, because he knew if anyone saw him going outside, that they would scold him. Bob was adamant to meet Santa and ask for his gumball machine, but he didn't see him anywhere as he opened the main door. Bob heard a rustling sound coming from the back of the house, as if someone was walking. At the back of the house, there stood a deep, dark woods filled with tall pine trees. With his small little feet, Bob walked towards the back of the house. He stood at the back of the house, facing the dark woods all by himself. He started to feel a little scared. The trees were bumping into each other as the wind passed through them. He spoke out in a low voice. Santa, where are you? Suddenly, he heard footsteps behind the nearby pine tree. He saw that same red-hooded person peeking out from behind a tree and calling to him. Bob slowly walked towards him. Meanwhile, Cherry was getting bored as she couldn't find Bob anywhere in the house. Even though she kept asking for claps, she couldn't hear any. The elders were so busy that they didn't notice anything going on with the two kids. Cherry looked out from the window and saw Bob walking towards the forest. She ran to the back gate. 
By the time she reached the outside, she couldn't see Bob anymore. He was nowhere to be found. Cherry was standing all alone in the freezing cold, staring at the woods. Suddenly, she heard a whimpering sound coming from the tree nearby. As she tiptoed in that direction, her face turned pale in fear. Bob was laying on the ground and a vicious looking creature was standing in front of him. It was at least seven feet tall with huge shark horns on its head. The face of the creature looked like a dead goat. It had a body of a giant human, but its feet were like that of a goat. There was a whip in his one hand and chains on the other. The creature was growling in a muffled way. Drenched in fear and terror, a word came out of her mouth. Krampus! Hearing its name from Cherry's mouth, Krampus looked at her with its burning red eyes. The huge red tongue came out of its mouth while saliva started to drip from it. Cherry screamed at the top of her lungs and Krampus growled in its demonic voice. The growl shook the entire forest and the sound echoed into the valley for at least two to three minutes. Kathy ran outside hearing her children's screams. As she came out, she saw Cherry sobbing and hiding her face in her hands while Bob was laying unconscious on the snowy forest ground. The next morning, Bob caught a high fever. Cherry couldn't sleep well for an entire week. Kathy and John didn't have the slightest idea what their little kids had saw outside. So what do you think? Did Cherry and Bob really see Krampus that night? Last year, I went to visit my girlfriend at my sister's house near the countryside. It's been two years we are holding on to this long-distance relationship. I wanted to surprise her, so I already made the plan with her sister. I took off work for a week to have a nice time with her. It was a four-and-a-half-hour drive from the city following the highway. I didn't ask any of my friends to accompany me because I wanted to relax on my own for a while. Due to huge work pressure at the office, I hardly get time for myself. The ride was a long-awaited opportunity for me to have a good time with myself. I went to the local gas station to fill up gas and check the air on the tires. I didn't want to face any problems, so I kept everything under the hood checked before starting my journey. I even took two extra tires as precautions. I packed my luggage and hopped in the car. It was 12 p.m. I predicted to reach there by 4.30, 5 p.m. I plugged my phone into the charger and put the location on GPS. This was the first time I am driving to the countryside, so I paid attention to the turns and roadblocks to stay in the right direction. After an hour of honking cars and city traffic, I finally got onto the highway. My eyes were charmed with the views around me. Vast green fields and a blue horizon were lying in front of my eyes. I turned up some music and took a few sips of cold lemonade that I brought on my way. My girlfriend's sister called me around 1.30 p.m. and asked how far I have reached. I told her I am hoping to reach there by 5 p.m. I was about to disconnect the phone just when she asked, Have you reached Crooked Country? The phone was on speaker so I replied in a loud voice, No, I don't think I have, but why do you ask? She told me, Peter, just follow the GPS. There will be two left turns after you cross the Crooked Country. You must take the second left turn, okay? I could sense a mild tension in her voice, but I couldn't understand why. I thought she might be worried as I am driving to her house for the first time. I replied to her, Of course, don't worry. I will see you guys soon. I scrolled the map and realized after 30 kilometers, I will reach Cricket Bay. So far, I only saw some oil trucks passing by. Last night, I ordered pizza for dinner and I packed the leftovers in case I get hungry while driving. I felt hungry. Also, my back needed a break, so I decided to stop for some time. As soon as I reached Crooked Bay, I noticed the landscape around me changing drastically. In the last 30 kilometers, the vast green field started to transform into bushes and trees. The Crooked Bay was a lot greener. Trees were standing tall on both sides of the road. I parked my car on the side of the road. The sounds of nature around me made me feel so alive. 
I was so happy for getting this much needed break. Just when I finished my pizza and went to wash my hands, I looked up at the sky. There were dark clouds all over the sky. I quickly wrapped things up as it was 2.15 p.m. already and I had 120 kilometers distance to travel. I passed over the first left turn just like Wanda told me to. Wanda is my girlfriend's sister's name. After 15 minutes, I reached the second left turn and took it without wasting any more time. The road now became quite narrow, surrounded by dense forest. It wasn't raining, but the dark clouds started to pour distant lightning and thunder. I checked the GPS and it showed me on the right track. I was checking out the map just when I heard a car horn. I looked at the rearview mirror and saw a dusty old car following me. I moved aside to let it pass, but the car didn't go away. It kept honking and following me like before. This time, I thought maybe the car owner is in some kind of trouble and telling me to stop. The car kept honking hence, it was really annoying for me to go in this way. As I stopped, the car came next to me and I saw a man wearing a big cowboy hat sitting on the driver's seat. I rolled down my window and asked, Hey, what's the matter? The man had a rough face, unevenly growing beard, dark circles under his eyes pointed out he doesn't live a very healthy life. He leaned towards the car and said in a feeble voice, I'm feeling very weak. Can you please drop me nearby? You might think I am rude, but that man was a complete stranger, so I didn't feel very sure to give him a ride. I told him, I have to travel a long way and I'm already late. Do you want me to call someone who will be able to help you? The man's face turned pale and he said, I don't have anyone to call as such. All this time his car stood beside mine. I could smell something really bad coming from his car. The car was dirty and I wondered what was the last time it had been washed. Anyways, I felt something off-putting about this entire situation because even though the guy said he was feeling sick, none of his actions proved likewise. Also, while talking to him, I noticed empty beer bottles lying on the seat beside him. I guessed this guy is probably drunk, hence he needs a lift. No way was I letting him in my car. I told him, See, I am new here, so I hardly know the road. Why don't you wait here as I call the nearby police station so they can help you in some way? The man suddenly got all freaked out. I expected this kind of reaction because he was driving drunk. He quickly replied, No thanks, I can pull myself. Before I could say anything more, he started the engine and drove ahead. I was surprised by his behavior, but just when the car drove away, I noticed something and my blood turned cold. There was a hand hanging out from the trunk of the car. It seemed like the hand of a man, but the color of its skin was so pale and lifeless. I started my car and kept driving behind it. It was a bumpy ride, but the hand kept hanging lifeless. After a certain point in time, I realized whoever is lying inside that man's car trunk is dead. I didn't know what to do, but at the same time, I didn't want to let this man run away. I googled the nearby police station and dialed them. I explained everything to the cop and also read out the car number. I was completely shaken. I told the cop that they must hurry because the man started to increase the speed of the car. At this point, I got sure that he realized that I was following him. Now my GPS showed me a right turn ahead for my destination, but I couldn't help but following this car. An idea came to my mind. I wanted to stop this guy because it felt like a responsibility to an innocent life that probably this man has taken. I wanted to hand him over to the cops, so I drove faster and reached next to his car window. The man grinned at me with a disturbed face, but I kept honking my car horn loudly this time. The man still didn't stop his car and kept increasing his speed. I was also adamant not to give up. I kept chasing him. The man did a very dangerous thing. He rolled down his right side window and started to throw the empty beer bottles on the road just to puncture my car tires. Somehow, I managed to dodge my car over the broken glass. But when the man threw the last beer bottle, it directly hit my car and out of panic, I hit his car pretty bad, resulting in a small crash. When I got back to my senses, 
I realized my head was bleeding as I hit the steering wheel and I saw the man's car crashed on the nearby tree. I unbuckled my seatbelt and rushed to his car. There was no one inside. The man was nowhere to be found. I checked my phone and saw a couple of missed calls from the police station. I called them back and told them to come to the location. I waited inside my car, thinking in case the man comes back, but there wasn't any sign of him. The cops came after half an hour. As they opened up the trunk of the car, we all witnessed a gruesome sight. A man was lying inside the trunk. His body was wrapped in plastic, but somehow his hand came out of it. Everyone could guess that this man was dead for a while now as someone slit his throat. I called Wanda and told her about all of this. I handed my phone to the cops and they also talked to her saying that they are going to drop me at home as I shouldn't be driving. They will take my car to the police station and I can come get it whenever I feel like it. The police car reached Wanda's house and I saw my girlfriend Misty running towards me all crying and sobbing. I hugged her as I was all tensed and terrified. After two days when I went to the police station, the cops revealed some bizarre information to us. For the last two to three months, many passengers seemed to be missing near Crooked Bay. Some cases were found by the family members, whereas in other cases, the cops found an abandoned car lying in the area with their owners missing. This so far was the first dead body they have found. It is the body of a man named Richard Smith, whose wife filed his missing case two months back. His wife told the police that her husband was coming from a fishing trip near Crooked Bay, but he never reached home. The cops found his car on the left turn where I stopped to eat. After forensics ran tests, they discovered surgical scars on Richard's body. The autopsy report showed that someone removed his liver and kidneys after making him unconscious. It was evident that the murderer sold his organs. The local newspapers were informed by the cops. They were instructed to spread awareness, stating there's a killer on the Crooked Bay who abducts lonely passengers and sells their organs after heavily drugging them. I didn't follow up on the news after coming back, but I hope they have managed to catch that man. Whenever I think about the first encounter with that evil man, my stomach drops. I can't guess what would have happened if I agreed to give him a lift in my car. Recently, I went camping with my best friend Thomas. We are childhood friends since we have been on several trips together. Thomas lived in the suburban area of California. After 10 kilometers from his house lied deep woods. Many people went camping and bird watching in those woods. During weekends, the woods were often crowded, so Thomas and I decided to camp as far as possible. I still regret our decision. Thomas and I left one sunny afternoon with our backpacks. After entering the woods, Thomas pointed out to our left and said in an excited tone, Peter, look, there's a railway trail on that side. We went close and found out an abandoned railway track going deep inside the woods. We decided to walk by the track. This way, we will find a serene spot for our camping and also it will be easy to come back. After walking for almost 30 to 35 minutes, we felt exhausted and decided to camp. We chose a spot under the trees and started to arrange our tent. The sun was about to set. The sky turned red as the birds started returning to their nests. The view felt awesome. We drank beer and watched the sun setting into the horizon and the night sky take over. Thomas brought his Bluetooth speaker. We tuned in some music and got busy preparing the bonfire. I collected some stones to make a round pit for the wood to burn. Thomas said, let's go collect some wood and water. There's a riverbed nearby. Though the sun has set, there was still light around us. On our way to the riverbed, Thomas was picking up wooden sticks and broken branches of trees for the fire. As we got close, a sound of water flowing by came to my ears. The riverbed was more like a narrow ditch, but it had crystal clear water flowing in it. I got down to fill our flasks and Thomas got busy collecting wood. I was almost done, just when the opposite bank of the riverbed caught my eyes. Due to the bushes, we failed to realize that there was an old graveyard on this side of the bank. I cried, Thomas, did you know we camped so close near a graveyard? His eyes lit up in excitement. 
He kept the pile of wood on the ground and crossed the ditch to check out the place. I too kept the flasks near the pile and went on with him. It was an old abandoned graveyard. There were at least 40 to 50 graves in it. Most of the tombstones dated from 1900 to the 1970s. I was a bit shocked to see a graveyard in the middle of the forest, but Thomas said that these graves can belong to the local tribes who once lived here. Don't know why, but something felt very odd to my eyes. Some of the graves seemed dug up recently. I told Thomas, Look, these graves seem like fresh diggings. Thomas rolled his eyes at me and said, Yeah, because zombies crawl out of them every night, and started to laugh. I shrugged it off too because of his leg pulling. Suddenly, we realized that we were standing in an abandoned graveyard and it has gotten dark all around us. We decided to head back to our camp. We didn't change our campsite because we were brave as well as old enough not to get scared by stupid ghost stuff. Thomas worked as a chef in a restaurant, so arranging food was his department. I, on the other hand, lit the fire and helped him to prepare our dinner. Thomas brought a whole chicken, marinated for a barbecue with him. He placed the chicken over the fire, and the smell of grilled chicken filled our hearts with joy. We were drinking, talking, eating. In one word, we were having a really good time. As the night passed away, the sounds of the woods became clear to our ears. We could hear the hooting of the owls, the sounds of crickets chirping in the dark, and the wood burning in the fire. I was enjoying this calm silence when I heard some other sound too. Thomas was about to play some music just when I said, no, no, stop. Did you hear that? He looked around and said, hear what? I told him that I heard footsteps on the dried leaves nearby. He laughed and said, you were just drunk, dude. But before he could finish laughing, a spine chilling scream made our hearts drop to our stomachs. We heard a woman screaming in absolute fear and pain. We both stood up in quick motion. Sweat appeared on our foreheads as we stared at each other cluelessly. The scream took place for the second time and Thomas and I figured out it was coming from the graveyard. Thomas turned all pale and looked at me. What should we do, Peter? Honestly, I was scared too, but somehow I wanted to check it out myself. So I told Thomas, to be quiet, it started to walk towards the graveyard. As we walked, the scream changed into a suppressed sobbing. I never believed in ghosts, but strangely, a feeling inside me said that the matter is not what it appears to be. I wish I was wrong that day. Seeing a ghost would have been much more comforting than what happened that night. We got down in the ditch and peeped to another side of the bank. What we saw made our skin crawl a man was pulling something into the graveyard. The sobbing was coming from that thing he was pulling. As he reached near a grave and flashed his light on the ground, we saw a woman was tied from hands to toe with a tight rope. Her face was duct taped. She tried to scream again, but before she could, the man took out a sharp knife and started to stab her vigorously. We could hear the sound of blood splattering on the ground. I couldn't believe what was happening in front of my eyes. We had no weapons or anything that will help us to fight this man. Our cell phone had no tower so that we could call someone for help. Thomas couldn't take it and attempted to run away. Just then, he twisted his ankle in the ditch and fell into it. He cried in pain and the man looked right at us. I realized he has noticed us. He will not let us leave alive from here. I ran to help Thomas and got him out of the ditch. We then ran to the campsite, but before we could figure anything out, I heard running footsteps on the dry leaves. Without delaying a second more, I grabbed my best friend's hand and we started to run for our life. We got on the rail tracks and ran. I looked back suddenly and saw a black shadow was chasing us like a hungry animal. The sharp steel knife on his hand glittered in the moonlight. Thomas was lagging behind because of his injury. I had no idea what to do. The way that man was running behind us, I knew he will end up catching Thomas. I was panting and breathing heavily. Thomas was crying for help. The entire situation was going out of our hand, and I knew if the man catches us, 
no one will ever know what happened to the bodies of two young boys who came camping in these woods. I saw a stone lying at the side of the railway track and I picked it up. I turned around and waited for Thomas to cross me over. I knew I was taking a huge risk, but I had to do something. Thomas came running at me and yelling, Run, Peter, run! But I stood there gathering all the courage inside me. As soon as the man came into my sight, I saw him flashing the knife to stab Thomas in the back. His eyes were dipped in anger, and a hungry smile on his evil-looking face made him look like the demon from hell. He was almost five hands distance from me when I aimed at his head and threw the rock at him with all my strength. A sound of skull cracking and blood spattering echoed into the woods. The man held his head and fell on the ground, making painful growls. His growls eventually turned into a soft whimper, and we realized that this guy has fainted. We ran out of the woods and reached the nearby police station. We explained everything to the cops. They sent Thomas to the hospital, and I came back with them to spot where I hit the man. As we reached near the railway tracks, we noticed a lot of blood lying on the ground, but the man was nowhere to be found. I took the cops to the graveyard, and after searching the place thoroughly, the cops discovered five fresh dead bodies, including the woman's body that lied near a grave. I burst out into tears, explaining to the cops how the man killed that woman in front of our eyes and we couldn't do anything to save her. I went back to the police station and gave a detailed description of that man's face so they can catch that demon. The posters are now all over our area. The FBI has been informed about this incident too. It came to know that the man is a suspected serial killer who chose an old abandoned graveyard to dump his murder victims at night. He even dumped his murder weapons and other pieces of evidence in the graves as well. Every day, I wake up in the morning and pray to God that the cops catch this killer before he takes any more innocent lives. I wish I could have stopped him that night from disappearing. This happened last winter. My husband, Sam and I, shifted to a new house in Texas. The neighborhood had a maximum of 20 to 25 houses. We were shifting our luggage inside the house after the helper's truck dropped them at our doorstep. My eyes went on the window of the opposite house on the other side of the road. I saw someone, a woman, at the window. She was peeking at us behind the curtains. Just when she noticed me looking at her, she closed the curtain immediately. I felt a bit odd, but then I thought she was only being curious. It often happens when people get new neighbors next door. The house was cozy and comfortable. I was happy. We were having dinner that night, just when the doorbell rang. We weren't expecting anyone, so my husband said, in a confused voice, Who can that be? I shrugged my shoulders and replied, I will check it out. As I opened the door, I saw a woman aged between 50 to 55 years standing at my door with a very disturbing smile on her face. In an awkward voice, um, yes? She smiled even bigger and said in a squeaky voice, hello dear, I am Miss Miller. I live in the opposite house. We are neighbors. I saw you two moving in, so came to welcome you with the little gift. I noticed there was a homemade vanilla cake in her hands. With red jelly, it had the word welcome written on it. The red color of the white cake seemed really bright, as if it was written with blood. I accepted the cake from her and said, that's so thoughtful of you. I am Mona Jones. Thank you for this kind gesture. We really appreciate it. She then stopped smiling and said in an overpowering tone, of course you do, and left strangely. I locked the door and came back to the dinner table. I told my husband how weird she was. He laughed and said, It's okay, Mona. People seem strange when you're a stranger to them too. I agreed with him and said, She gave us this welcome gift and showed him the cake. My husband has always been a sweet tooth, so he seemed really happy to see it. After finishing our dinner, we decided to watch a movie and eat the homemade vanilla cake for dessert. But as I began to cut the first piece, a weird sound took place. 
It felt like the knife cracked something inside this cake. My husband was standing right after him, and even he got surprised too. He took a fork and dig the cake to look what's inside. I might have vomited right at that moment, but somehow controlled myself. There were broken nails and hair strands inside the cake. My husband said in disgust, what the fuck? How can someone send a cake like this to anyone? I was utterly disturbed and said, is she trying to prank us or something? My husband said, don't know. Seems like you were right about this woman's weirdness, Mona. We threw the cake immediately in the garbage bin. Since that night, a sense of suspicion started to grow in my mind about this woman. One day, my husband was at work. I was alone in the house. It was around 5 p.m. in the evening. The chilly winter started to take over the town. I decided to head to the local store to get a bottle of wine and some other stuff to prepare for dinner. As I got ready and came outside, I noticed that woman walking towards me with the same creepy smile. I didn't pay any attention and started to lock the door. She came near the porch and said, Hi dear, looks like you're going out, huh? I smiled carelessly and said, Yeah, she was standing there irrespective of the fact that I wasn't showing any interest in talking to her. She said, how do you like the cake, dear? I was really surprised to see her audacity this time. I looked at her and said, will you please excuse me? I am in a hurry. I was walking away just when she asked me for a completely unexpected question. She called my name and said, Mona, can I ask you something? I turned back and said, What is it, Miss Miller? She said in the same squeaky voice, Are you pregnant? Though I wasn't at the time, her question was very rude and extremely personal. I lost it finally and said in a coarse voice, Listen, Miss Miller, I think you are crossing your limits now. We hardly know you and honestly have no interest in being around you. It would be better if you just leave and mind your own business from now on. I saw her face turning red in anger, but then she spoke in a cold voice. You can't help but be around me, dear. After all, we are neighbors. Then she turned back and walked away. When my husband came from work, I told him about this entire incident. He was shocked to hear it too, but he called me down and said, it will be better if we just avoid her from now on. A few days passed away and we didn't see Miss Miller. One night, I went to dump the garbage in the backyard. Our backyard was a small garden area. My husband planted some seasonal flowers along with some basic vegetables like cherry tomato and chilies in the garden. I was dumping the bean bag in the dumpster when my eyes got caught up at our fence. I saw a trail of ashes surrounding our fences from the outside. As I followed the fences, I discovered our entire house was marked with ashes into a square from the outside. I was scared of seeing this suspicious marking of our house. My husband checked it too and said that someone might have done this when we were asleep last night. I knew very well who could be that person. I wanted to confront our freak neighbor, but my husband stopped me. He said, Mona, we can't just accuse her without any proof, you know. He then washed the lines of ash with soap water and we finally went to bed. I couldn't sleep well the entire night. I had nightmares and woke up cranky the next morning. It was a Sunday. I went to the main door to pick up the milk bottle just when I noticed burnt out candles and essences were lying on our doormat. I was fucking angry this time. I cleaned the entire area and came back in a very bad mood. I didn't say anything to my husband about this because I knew he would tell me the same thing. We were invited to lunch that day by a couple who lived beside our house. Gina and Charlie became our friends in no time. They were really sweet and we kind of bonded. So, it was the first time we were going to a neighborhood event. They invited others from our locality. We arrived at their place in the afternoon 
and saw a small gathering of people partying in their backyard. We were doing barbecues and drinking beer. Sam got mixed up with them immediately. I was sitting in a chair in the corner. I was a bit off that day. Gina came to me and handed me a bottle of beer. She sat down beside me and said, What's wrong, Mona? You seem awfully quiet today. I smiled hesitantly and asked her, You didn't invite Miss Miller? Gina's face turned really annoying hearing Miss Miller's name. She said in an irritated voice, Everyone in this neighborhood avoids her. We all have good reasons for that. She is so creepy and weird, you know? When Charlie and I moved here for the first time, she suddenly came one night to greet us with her welcome gift. Do you know what that old hag did? She said in an angry tone. I was surprised to hear that Miss Miller has approached Gina the same way she approached me. I said in a curious tone, What? Gina replied, She gave us a pie. When I went to eat it, I found fallen teeth and some tiny animal bones inside it. Just think how shitty and fucking creepy it was. I told Gina about the cake Miss Miller gave me as a welcoming gift. Gina told me in a strict voice, Mona, you do not want to talk to a person like that. You know what? The entire town calls her a witch. Some people even say she is into all the voodoo and black magic stuff, and she secretly watches people from her window. I have seen her peeking behind her window curtains many times. It's just better if you just avoid her. Gina's words scared me even more. After the party, I came back home and searched on the internet about this black magic stuff. I read online that burning candles and incenses were actually part of voodoo rituals. I wanted to teach this woman a lesson, so I came up with a plan. One morning, I was sitting on my porch facing the streets when I saw Miss Miller leaving the house to buy groceries in her old red car. I noticed her going out only twice a week. I was waiting for that opportunity. As soon as she left, I went to her house and placed some burning candles and incenses on her doormat. I trapped a rat in her basement. I wanted to give this woman a taste of her own medicine. I placed the dead rat on her footstep. I wanted to scare her just how she was scaring me. So I put some ashes around her house, making it seem like someone did black magic on her this time. After all of this, I went inside, locked my door, and waited for her return. After an hour, I heard the car horn and realized that she has come back. I stood behind the living room window curtain and watched her silently. As soon as she came out of the car, walked to her door, I heard her screaming like a maniac. She was screaming at the top of her lungs as if she had seen a ghost, but I never expected the matter to get out of hand. She screamed like this for a few moments and fainted on the ground. The next door neighbor called the paramedics and they took her to the hospital. My husband went to the hospital along with some other people from our locality. I was sweating like hell thinking my little prank made her seriously sick. When my husband returned home, his face seemed very serious. I asked him in a scared voice, What is it, Sam? How is she now? Sam said in a sad voice, She died of a heart attack. The doctors are saying she got surprised to see all those weird stuff at her door and couldn't handle the shock of it. I wonder who kept all that near her door. Sick jokes people play these days. I was out of words. I sat down on the couch nearby and said in a shaken voice, well, Gina told me she used to put this weird stuff at people's doorstep. Someone wanted to stop her this time so that she learns a lesson, you know. Sam looked at me and said, Come on, Mona. Miss Miller is a 55-year-old woman. She is lonely and insane. Don't tell me you believe all this witch rumor about her. She lost her husband in a car accident and had no children of hers. She was not thinking right at all. I sat quietly for an hour. My husband thought I was just sad to know about Miss Miller's sudden death. He consoled me and told me not to be upset. It's sad, but after all, she died of a heart attack. There's nothing that could have been done to save her. I like to think that my husband is right, but I still can't shake the feeling that her heart attack was caused by my stupid revenge idea. 
I don't know how her black magic and all that voodoo stuff was real or not, but I just wanted her to stay away from us. I didn't kill this woman on purpose. Do you think I did? I have a horrible dream these days. In my dream, I see myself locked in a dark place. There's no sign of light or air around me. My lungs feel heavy when I try to breathe. I can't move my body no matter how much I try. I scream, but no sound comes out of my mouth. All I hear is pin drop silence. And then I see my eyelids dropping and I fall asleep again. There's nothing I can do about it, but I know how it all started. Two years back, I bought a new car. I passed my driving exam and got the license. After a hectic week at work, I often went out for a long drive on the highway. I like driving on the empty highway at night as there's no traffic on the road. I could enjoy a calm and quiet time with myself on the highway. The moonlight made the road look poetic at night. Long drives were stress busters for me. Whenever I had a bad time, I went for a ride at night. My parents often told me not to drive far away at night on the highway, but I didn't pay attention to them. Now I feel I should have. Last week, one of my office colleagues told me about a pub near the IMR highway. He said the pub was a good place to go for a drink after a long, thrilling highway ride. I plan to go there, not just to hang out in the pub, but also to enjoy a thrilling ride back home late night. I went for a car wash on Saturday morning. My mom called and asked me to come over for dinner at her place, but I told her I have other plans. She told me the weather reports predicted a huge storm tonight, so I should cancel my highway ride for my own safety. I looked at the bright sunny sky and I told her, I will be fine. I was planning for this ride since last week, hence no way I was going to cancel it. I got home and took some rest so that I can drive in a refreshed mood. My colleague told me that the pub closes at 10 p.m. I decided to start around 8.30 p.m. so that I can reach there by 9.30 p.m. I did exactly as I planned. Once again, I looked up at the sky and there were little clouds here and there. I have driven on the highway during the rainy season so it didn't bother me at all. It was 8.15 p.m. sharp. I started the engine and my weekend began. The view was breathtaking. The IMR highway had many adjacent freeways and expressways. The location my colleague gave me indicated an expressway. After 30 minutes of driving straight ahead on the highway, my GPS spotted an expressway on my left, which led to the pub. It's easy to drive in expressways at night, but even in daylight, freeways can scare the hell out of any skilled driver. This was probably the main reason why my mother never appreciated my late night long drives. The passing of a heavy truck, its loud honking horns and bright lights were enough to confuse any small car. The more I carried on to the highway, the more thrilling it all started to become. There was a deep forest all around me. I could hear the owl hooting, the rustling of dry leaves as I drove by. Around 9.15 p.m., I finally saw a light on the left side of the road. As I reached closer, I spotted the wooden cabin. The owner turned it into a small pub. There were a couple of motorcycles standing outside the bar. I didn't see any other car there. I parked my car and got out. As I stepped inside the pub, I saw seven to eight people hanging out there. The pub was about to close in an hour, hence many people already left the place. I sat at the bar and ordered a beer. My mom called me twice, but I chose not to pick up. I already knew what she was going to say. I didn't want my mood to get ruined, thus I ignored her calls as usual. I asked the bartender how long they have opened this pub. The guy told me that it hasn't been long and started to tell me about the owner. After chilling there for almost an hour, I realized my head was feeling slightly heavy. Suddenly, I recalled that I have a long ride back home, so I decided to pay and leave. I looked at my phone. It was 10 p.m. already, and there was no one in the pub. I also got up to leave, and as I went to pay the bartender, he told me to drive carefully on the highway. I was a little drunk, hence his words started to sound like my mother's. I laughed at him and said, dude, I am driving for like two years now. Stop act, stop talking like my mother. I accepted I was rude to him, but I already told you I was drunk. 
I got inside the car, twisted my keys, and started the engine. I drove the long way, even after being really drunk, so I was quite confident about my driving skills. I rolled up my window and noticed raindrops on my windshield. It started to rain lightly. I reversed the car and went towards the highway. The expressway was completely empty and dark. My headlights did a pretty good job of showing me the way ahead. As I reached the highway, a huge bolt of lightning struck in the distance. The sound of it almost made my ears numb. The wind started to blow frantically and I realized the storm has now begun. I continued on the highway for 20 minutes and suddenly heavy rain took place. My car wipers tried really hard to clear out the view in front of my eyes, but the rain grew heavier. I felt I should have left earlier. I kept driving from the left side and suddenly another lightning struck really close to my car. The forest around me was roaring like an angry demon. I got so scared with the sudden strike of lightning that my car almost got out of control. I couldn't see anything. I was just driving by guessing. After 10 minutes of hustle, I realized I have gotten to a freeway. A huge oil tanker passed right next to my car honking. My heart fell into my stomach because I knew it would be even more dangerous to find my way back now. I knew I took a wrong turn in fright and tension. I can't stop in the middle of the road because the huge trucks were coming really fast. The thunder and lightning almost made it impossible to drive. I decided to stop by a turn or an adjacent alley to the high road. After an extremely tense ride of 15 minutes, I could finally spot an abandoned road on my left with a dead end sign. I immediately decided to park my car there and spend the night in my car. I can't drive home or get out of this freeway at least not in this weather, so I thought it would be better for me if I just slept in my car tonight. I realized it would be safer to get out of this freeway in the morning. I was about to take the left turn just when I heard a loud honk. As I turned around to look, I saw a huge truck coming at my car. I panicked and pressed the accelerator so hard that my car took up sudden high speed. I couldn't control the situation and my car crashed into a huge tree almost making an explosion. My glass windows were shattered. I was covered with broken glass after hitting my head badly. The car alarm went on and I saw my eyelids closing. Since then, I have this terrible dream which I can't really figure out. It feels like I am forever stuck in this dream and I can never wake up. I call out for my mother, I call out for my father, but no one answers my cry. Just now, I realized why. Right now, at this very moment, I can hear my mom sobbing. I can't see her because it's so dark around me. I can't walk up to her as I can barely move. She is crying like a maniac and her words are even more insane than her reaction. Do you know what she is telling me now? Oh, Jamie, I told you not to go out in the storm that night, but you never listened to me. I told you it's not safe to drive alone on the highway at night, but you ignored my words. I can't take this pain. I can't believe my son is trapped inside this wooden coffin forever. I never imagined that I would come to visit you in your grave. I have this dream all the time. I see myself locked up in a dark, claustrophobic space. I can't move. I can't speak. I just keep staring at the darkness around me.